Well, hey, we are live on YouTube. <laughs> We've got the eyes of Texas. The eyes of Texas are on you till Gabriel closes. What is up, YouTube? We are broadcasting live from the historic Crown and Anchor Pub on 30th Street, getting you set for the NCAA tournament bracket reveal. It is Selection Sunday. More importantly, it is St. Paddy's Day. Can we get some noise for that? Yeah! Come on. Come on, y'all. We are Texas Sports Unfiltered. We're going to be live for the next two hours talking college basketball, but also having a bunch of fun as well. We are less than an hour away from the reveal of the NCAA tournament bracket. We will find out where the Texas Longhorns will be playing in the big dance. And we are excited to talk all things college basketball. And also, we got some green beer in front of us. We're going to have a good time today as well. Thank you to everyone who's out here at Crown and Anchor. If you're not here right now, get here. We'll be here for the next couple of hours. And the party is going on here all day and all night for St. Paddy's Day. Should be a, a fun one. If you're at the baseball game right now, make sure you stop by afterwards to come see us. And uh, they've got a great raffle here, too, at Crown and Anchor today where the proceeds are going to the Austin Humane Society. So you get to come here, have some beers, have a great time, talk some college hoops, and also make a difference in our community as well. I am BK Brad Kellner, joined by our basketball guru here on Texas Sports Unfiltered, the great Zay Collier. Zay, feels like Christmas for college basketball fans. March Madness is officially upon us, and the brackets come out here in less than an hour. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, really beautiful, and one of my favorite days of the year, Selection Sunday, a lot of teams put, punching their ticket in, dancing in the show, and this is what it's all about, you know, seeing these upsets, seeing these teams that have a lot of aspirations to win a national championship, and we'll see where our Longhorns end up. You know, it's been an up-and-down season for Rodney Terry. They've been on the bubble at times. They look like a team that was – maybe go to the final four you don't know what team you're gonna get but yep. exciting time in the year and we'll see where they go 100 100 percent. up and down is a great way to describe this texas basketball season but the good news is we know texas will be in the dance right That's there was right. a stretch in the middle of conference play where we weren't sure this longhorn team was good enough to be in the field of 68 they got hot enough down the stretch in Big 12 play, unfortunately, their stay in the Big 12 tournament in Kansas City was very short-lived, right, losing their first game against Kansas State. But we know that Texas will be in. We're just trying to figure out what seed they are going to be, who they are going to play, and where they will be playing. And it feels like, Zay, just taking a look at all of the bracketologies that are out there right now, it feels like Texas is going to be an 8 or a 9 seed, right? And that means, okay, your first matchup will be against an eight or a nine seed. And then if you win, more than likely you're going up against a one. So it's a scary draw, but hey, crazier things have happened. And we've seen this Texas basketball team play with some of the toughest teams in the country. We've also seen them lose to teams that they have no business losing to. But when you think of Texas right now, does eight, nine, does that feel fair? Does that feel like a good spot for where this Texas team should be with what you've seen from them? Yeah, it does. I mean, as you said, in the Big 12 tournament, didn't have the showing that they would have liked losing to Kansas State. But the pros of that is you get some much-needed rest. You think about guys like Dylan Gassou, who have been injured a lot during the season, came around towards the second part and had a terrific Big 12. He kind of tweaked his ankle in that last game. You go back to Baylor, where he had lost his footing and hurt his leg, and everybody kind of held their breath. Well, he definitely needs this much-needed rest. Yeah. And when you go in March – most of, a lot of the time, the most well-rested team is a team that advances opposed to a team that's winning their conference tournament that's played a lot of games in a five-day span like a North Carolina State. So you look around the nation, you see guys that are pretty beat up, but, hey, everybody's beat up this time of the year. It's March. you got to suck it up and play through, and we see you do the best at that. Absolutely, yeah. We'll be previewing what we think is going to happen on Selection Sunday, but, of course, we'll give immediate reaction once the, once the brackets do come out a little after 5 o'clock. And uh, we'll talk about the Longhorns. Of course, we'll talk about some of the other teams in the NCAA tournament field. And it has been a wild week of conference tournaments, Zay. Not a good year to be on the bubble. Like, thankfully, the Longhorns did enough in the regular season to where we're not sweating things out today. But you look at Texas A&M, you look at Oklahoma, some of Texas's biggest rivals, they're not so sure what their status is today because of how many bid stealers we've had over the last few days. We didn't have to wait for the NCAA tournament for the madness to begin this year. It's already started. We've got a couple of more bid stealers happening today. It's been a wild week, and 
uh, not a good year to be on the bubble. No, not at all. And if you look at Oklahoma, who lost their best player, J.V. McCullough, he didn't play in their lone Big 12, uh, Big 12 tournament game. That might be a reason why he goes out. I mean, if you go back to this past football season with Florida State, them not getting in because of their starting quarterback getting hurt, even though they were undefeated. I mean, you want to see a good product out there. In Oklahoma right now, they're not putting up a good product. No. So, hey, we might be in Texas country, and, yeah, I might be biased and could care less if they get in or not. But if you're an OU fan, you're kind of biting your fingernails right now in the anticipation, seeing where everything draws out based on teams like Oregon, who won the Pac-12 tournament that was on the bubble cup coming into yesterday, or North Carolina State that, that won the ACC tournament that had no chance of making it if they didn't win that tournament, winning five straight games. Hell of a job for that crew. So, yeah, if you're on the bubble, somebody's going to get screwed over today, and luckily it's not the Longhorns. You know, we've got this American Athletic Championship going on right now, the ACK, as I like to call it, and you've got UAB and Temple playing. That might be my favorite part of this entire week. <laughs> I remember the last time these two teams played a few weeks ago, there was a huge gambling scandal ah. that came from that game, and people were looking into whether or not Temple had fixed that last matchup. And now the winner of this game, it's looking like it's going to be UAB, is going to make it to the tournament. But you're right, NC State, uh, UAB, Oregon, there have been bid stealers all over the place right now. And I'm looking at Joe Lenardi's, I think this is his last bracketology before the actual bracket comes out. How about this? If you're a Texas fan, you might get a kick out of this. A&M, one of the last four buys. TCU, one of the last four buys. Oklahoma is currently Joe Lenardi's last team in the field of 68. And I'm not one of those guys who ever roots for the state. I'm not one of those guys who ever roots for teams in the conference. I think it would be hilarious if A&M and Oklahoma were left at the altar today and were on the outside looking in of the dance. But, yeah, these teams that you felt like they were safe a couple of days ago, all of a sudden, not so much. So, it's, uh, it's going to be an interesting day for sure, but obviously Texas is in a good spot right now. And Joe Lenardi has Texas as an 8 seed taking on Dayton out of the A-10 as a potential first-round matchup in the Midwest region, which the number one seed in that region is Purdue. And I, I think that's a good thing, right? You look at Purdue and what they've done in the tournament under Matt Painter. I know they have the back-to-back -back National Player of the Year and Zach Eady. I know Purdue beat Texas in the tournament a couple of years ago in Chris Beard's first season. Uh, but that's a team that generally comes up small in the big dance. That wouldn't be the worst matchup. And, oh, by the way, Purdue lost to a 16 seed last year. So maybe we should be putting some more stock into who the 16 seed is. That might not be the worst situation for Texas to be in if that's exactly what ends up happening here. Yeah, with the transfer portal, BK, the 16 seed ain't that same 16 seed as years prior. I mean, again, you're getting guys playing in COVID years, playing in their fifth season. I saw a dude on Howard. He's playing in this eighth season. He's the same age as guys like Jason Tatum and Shea Gilchrist Alexander no play way. in the National Basketball Association. How come we so, couldn't get that? I don't know. I wanted to be in college COVID, for eight years. Yeah, this COVID extra season is absolutely ridiculous. I think it comes to an end next year. Yeah. But, yeah, as you were saying, Purdue, I mean, Zach Eady, he's an absolute hoss. And the difference between Matt Painter's teams in previous years to what this year is, they're number two in the nation when it comes to three-point percentage. So you can't just help on Zach Eady like you have in the past, even though he's averaging 24 points, 11 rebounds. you got to worry about guys like Lance Jones and guys like Brandon Smith, who did get hurt in the Big 12 uh, – um, excuse me, in the Big 10 tournament – He's one of their best players. He has to be 100% very healthy for the Boilermakers if they want to make a run. He's averaging around 12 points, five rebounds, seven assists. Like, that's some pretty top-tier numbers in college basketball. Yep. So, their point guard, he's going to definitely use this rest. But, yeah, Purdue, Matt Painter's teams, you always got to be a little nervous if you're picking them in the bracket due to his history. Absolutely. All right, let me ask you this, Jay. I think we know who three of the four number one seeds are going to be today. But I'll ask you, if you're filling out the bracket, if you are the selection committee, who are your four number one seeds and what order are you placing them in? Um, I would probably go UConn, number one overall seed. I think that's easy. You know, you think about what they did in the Big East tournament, winning that all, even though Marquette and Shaka Smart were without Tyler Kolick. UConn handled their business, and Dan Hurley, he looks like a team that could go repeat just like Billy Donovan did with that 06-07 Florida team. Yep. So UConn, number one overall. At number two, mm, this is where it gets a little tough because do you put Houston in there or do you put that team from um, – gosh, it's not North Carolina. I'm missing one. I don't know what team I'm missing that's 
should be number three, but it's in between Houston, Purdue, right? No, North Carolina, Tennessee, Arizona. I'll say Purdue. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll say Purdue. Even though they lost in the Big Ten tournament, I'll say they'd be that number two spot. Yeah. And then Houston. They got absolutely drove by Iowa State. What we happened should, yesterday? I, you know, Calvin Sampson said something very interesting the Houston head coach before the game. He said, you know, even if we lose the game today, this doesn't matter as much because we got more bigger things to play for, which is true, but I don't like that mindset. You want to win every game and take it very seriously. I think he saw the writing on the wall and how exhausted this team is with their big man Roberts being hurt. So I see them being number three and then slipping in at that number four spot, the Big 12 champions, Iowa State. You think so? Oh, man, you said it on uh, Thursday or Wednesday when we were on the show how good Iowa State is, and you thought they could win the Big 12 tournament. And, man, they showed out. T.J. Otzenberger's squad, they are so tough, led by uh, Taman Lipsy and led by uh, Kenneth Gilbert. Both of those guys are hell of a players. And if they could get Monchilovic going, he showed out yesterday. Three-point shooter, he's only a freshman, so he hit that freshman ball during a very hectic Big 12. But if he could get going, look out for Iowa State as that team that could shock a lot of people and dance their way to Phoenix. Yeah, I'm with you 100%. I think Iowa State should be the fourth number one seed, but I think because North Carolina is North Carolina and they carry the weight that that program carries, I think they are going to be the fourth number one seed. But I think that's a good thing for Iowa State because whoever that fourth number one seed is going to be shipped out west, right? And for Iowa State, if they're the two seed in the Midwest, they'll get closer to a home court advantage. Like we saw how much of an impact their fans could make in Kansas City. <laughs> and I told you, Zay, before that uh, Big 12 tournament even started that Iowa State – they travel incredibly well to Kansas City. They call the T-Mobile Center Hilton South. They treat that like the Super Bowl, man. Yeah. Like that, I think they care more about the Big 12 tournament than they care about any other game that they play all year long. They might care about that more than the NCAA tournament. It is crazy how much stock they put into that. But it's the old cliche. You want to be playing your best basketball going into March? Iowa State is playing its best basketball right now, and I'm with you. Like I think they will be a trendy pick to actually make it to the final four this year, regardless of if they're the fourth number one seed or maybe the first number two seed. Defense travels, defense wins. And yeah. Iowa State, they have that. Again, you look at their two guards, you have to have great guard play to win a national championship. If you look at last year's Connecticut team, who has Tristan Newton, who's back this year, he's the best player in the Big East right now. Last year they had Jordan Hawkins. He's in the NBA. They had Andre uh, Jackson. He's in the NBA playing for the Bucks. So you've got to have extremely good guard play yep. to move and advance in the tournament. And that's what Iowa State has. Again, Lipsy, Gilbert, those guys can really go, and their defense leads the way. But when you can hit shots when the shot clock's going down five seconds and get good ISO play, because that's – yeah, you're so scouted. These coaches are so good. The longer that you advance, you're going to be even more heavily scouted. So can you make those shots when the offense completely just fries down? Can you knock down shots and take your man one-on-one? -on -one? And as you saw with Lipsy and Gilbert yesterday against U of H, Iowa State's got those guys to do it. Yeah, because of that performance yesterday, Iowa State is now the number one team in defensive efficiency, according to Ken Palm. Like Houston has been number one in that stat all year long, and Iowa State just surpassed him, uh, holding Houston to 41 no, Houston was ranked number one in the country, right? Everyone sees all these seeds, so it's kind of confusing who's ranked what. But U of H was the number one team in the AP poll. Iowa State held them to 41 points. That's the fewest a team has allowed in a win over AP number one since 1957 when Iowa State beat Wilt Chamberlain in Kansas, and they held them to 37 points. you got to go back to 1957, pre-shot clock era, the last time a number one team in the country was held to just 41 points. So – yeah, Iowa State, they are a, a dangerous bunch right now. Once again, I think their resume is actually better than North Carolina's. I don't know how much that actually matters because people have just well, kind of accepted UNC being the one seed, which feels ridiculous, but that's usually how it works. Yeah, and you make a good point. North Carolina, they're the blue blood brand. I mean, think about the history with guys like Vince Carter and Michael Jordan and James Worthy, et cetera, Dean Smith, list goes on. But – they lost to a team that wasn't supposed to even make the tournament in North Carolina State. Yeah. Meanwhile, you got Iowa State winning the best conference tournament or the best conference in the nation, the conference tournament. Yeah. So I think they're more deserving. But again, it's little old Iowa State. And you're right. If they get that Midwest spot, hey, the way that team travels, that's a good spot for them. But 
yeah, I think they're deserving of number one, absolutely. Yeah, how about this? Um, Iowa State actually played four more Q1 games than North Carolina this year. And Jerry Palm, one of the top bracketologists out there for CBS, he actually has Iowa State as his fourth number one seed. Give it to him. So Joe Lenardi, just about everybody else, seemingly has UNC still in that spot for the fourth number one. But Jerry Palm paying some respects to the Cyclones for what they were able to do this week. And like I think going into the week, it was, you know, North Carolina or Tennessee. Like, whoever wins their conference tournament, they are going to get that number one spot. Neither team got it done. I mean, regular season Rick came out. We see, oh, we see that from Rick Come Barnes on, every Rick. single year. I mean, it's absolutely insane. And I'll give this stat right now, by the way, because well, we'll help the folks fill out the brackets a little bit, even though the brackets aren't even out yet. And, of course, we'll be talking about this stuff all week long on Texas Sports Unfiltered. There has never been a team that lost its – conference tournament opener that has gone on to win the national championship Ooh. it has never happened so you look at a team like tennessee you look at a team like kansas i don't know how many people are picking kansas to win it all right now because of uh, the way that they look down the stretch you look at uh, i'm trying to think who else fits that mold duke duke is a team that lost its first game in the acc tournament this year there's never been a team lose its first game in their conference journey that has won the whole thing so that is bad news right there a lot of folks have been saying, oh, this is it for Rick Barnes. Like, we know what he's done in the past in the month of March, but, like, this is his team. He's got Dalton Connect, who's one of the best players in the country. They've got good guard play. They're deep. But, you know, it's it, it's going to be so hard, and Texas fans know this better than anybody, to pick a Rick Barnes-led team to actually make it to the Final Four because that's usually not what happens. Yeah, Rick Barnes gets a little tight this time of the year. I mean, one thing about the NCAA tournament, you got to have faith in your guys to go out there and ball and the preparation that you did all year long, they're going to be ready for it. I think Rick Barnes, he gets a little nervous, and his team feeds off of that. And he's always talked about not liking the conference tournaments, going back to his Texas days. He wished they weren't even around. So you know the preparation going into that game versus Mississippi State wasn't all there. He could care less. He probably thinks that they're better off just getting rest like a lot of these other teams so no that's not a good stat for a team like Tennessee but when you have a player like Don Connect who's a top five player in the nation and a guy that can create his own shot and take over a game like again you need serious shot making and serious shot making guards and connects as good as it gets so you can ride the guy but again all these game plans that are going to be set are going to be for him. They're yeah. going to be focused on Don Connect and stopping them. He's going to see multiple double teams. Can guys like Jordan James and Ziggler get going to help get guys settled and open due to their you know longevity and experience? I think they can, but I don't see Rick Barnes and them going further than the Elite Eight. Yeah, for the record, I'm not trying to ride Don Connect or anybody on that Tennessee team. All right. It's <laughs> You know, we're not doing yeah, that's that. That's not my style here. That's yeah. not my style. To each his own. Hey, you know? hey, Rick Barnes needs to ride whatever he can to the championship. What, I think he'll take it. Whatever it will take, yeah, to get Rick Barnes back to the Final Four for the first time in, what, 21 years. Of course, he got there with Texas in 03, but uh, here in Austin and up there in Knoxville, just uh, a lot of tournament heartbreak for Rick Barnes there. Yeah. At least going back to Rick Barnes' history, yeah. if yeah. you look at his former players, Connects probably the third best player he's ever coached after TJ Ford and Kevin Durant. And that's saying a lot. Wow. Now, Kevin Durant, that team lost in round of 32 to USC. And a lot of people say, man, how can you lose with Kevin Durant? The dude was still a freshman and he faced a lot of good NBA players with Todd Gibson and Swaggy P on that Southern yeah. Cal team. But still, like to my point, Connect is one of the best players that Barnes has ever had. Maybe he could lead those guys. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Uh, taking a look at some of these other bracketologies. And once again, we will have the official reveal a little after five o'clock. We'll uh, react to it with y'all here on Texas Sports Unfiltered. We are live at Crown and Anchor Pub. Make sure y'all get here if you're not here already. And it, it appears the Big 12, once again, is going to get more teams in the dance than any other conference in the college basketball. Joe Lenardi has nine Big 12 teams making it to the NCAA tournament. And, and this is a debate people have every year. Like, you know, Texas is so battle tested. Every Big 12 team is so battle tested because there are really no nights off in this conference. It is a gauntlet getting through this league. Do you, do you feel like that benefits Texas? Do you feel like that benefits Big 12 teams? It's almost like, you know, the NCAA tournament is still incredibly hard. You got to win six games in a row to win a national championship. But do you feel like it might be better for Texas that they are this battle tested going into March? Or do you feel like, uh, they might be a little worn down from having to go through the entirety of this 18-game conference schedule. 
Yeah, a little bit of both. Yeah. I mean, think about the teams that they face. You play against Houston twice. You play Baylor twice. You play against Iowa State. Like, you play against three legitimate teams that have a chance to win the Natty. And, yeah, I think they're definitely battle-tested. And, again, going back to losing to Kansas State, like, they're getting that much-needed rest. Now, a lot of these teams, they are beat up from a brutal Big 12, but you're getting a lot of rest losing that game this past Tuesday and possibly playing on – Thursday or Friday. So yeah, that's what Dylan Dassu needs. Yeah. Tyrese Hunter, Max Aceman, especially coming from the Summit League. Like it was a big eye opener on just the difference of the competition. And even though he was second team all Big 12 and was terrific this year, he still definitely beat up from this year. So yeah, I expect Texas to be battle tested and be ready. And that goes, you know, if you're Rodney Terry, what haven't you seen? Like that's you should be fearless. It's just all about matchups. And Ronnie Terry's coaching is going to be put on display this year. I mean, look, talk about hot seat, whatever. A lot of people still don't think he's the guy. A lot of people think that they should have waited it out and maybe went for somebody else. And it was just a hire based on the rhythm that those horns last year were on, which a lot of that's tough to base off of because that was Chris Beard's team. This is a big time for Ronnie Terry. If you could win these next two games, which will probably be against a one or a two seed in that round of 32, then, hey, I think he's the guy for a little bit. But, again, this Texas team was top 25 coming into the year, yep. even though they've had ups and downs. Getting to the Sweet 16 is overachieving for this squad. Yeah, you know, 100%. And it's not like Texas is the only team that's been a little bit disappointing when you compare their season to the preseason ranking. I mean, hey, look at the team that knocked Texas out of the tournament last year. No, not the refs. Miami. Mm. Miami made it to the Final Four last year. They're nowhere close to the NCAA tournament this yep. year. You look at a team like Kansas State, right? Kansas State, of course, beat Texas in the Big 12 tourney last week. That's a team that also made it to the Elite Eight. They were expected to be great. They're not making it to the dance. Texas A&M ranked ahead of Texas in the preseason poll. We're not sure if they are going to get in either. So, you know, it's it's been a roller coaster ride. Michigan State was ranked number four to start the year. They might not make it in. Now they're going to make it in because Michigan State will get that yeah. blue blood bias like they always do. But it's just it happens in college basketball. And I hate saying this because I I try like hell to prevent other people from feeling this way, and I don't feel this way. But March is all that matters in this sport. Yep. Like. I don't give a damn what Rodney Terry has done to this point. Did I want this season to be better? Sure. But all that matters is the NCAA tournament, right? Like if Texas lost, if they were a two seed and they lost in the second round, that'd be incredibly disappointing. So they're an eight seed. Like if they make it to the sweet 16, I think that's a successful season. So even though the regular season didn't go the way that we expected it to, this was a team pick to finish third in the toughest league in the country. And they finished seventh and they were 500 in the big 12. None of that stuff matters right now. Your legacy as a coach is defined by what you do in March. Chris Beard was hired because of the success that he had in the month of, month of March. There were some years in Lubbock where his teams just weren't that good, but they got hot at the right time and made some deep NCAA tournament runs. If Rodney Terry is able to replicate what happened last year or come close to what happened last year in the dance, then I don't care what you've tweeted or said about RT to this point. you got to feel really confident like that he can be the guy to run a stable program going forward. So you know, forget what's happened to this point. If Texas can have a good Thursday to Sunday and they can win two games this coming week, then I think that changes my perception, and I think that should change a lot of folks' perception about RT going forward. Yeah, whichever number one seed has the possibility of playing them, they should be a little nervous because Texas, even though we've seen that roller coaster, we've seen them on their downs, and then we've seen them in their highs. And those highs, that's a scary squad. I mean, Tyrese Hunter, he's going to have to play his ass off this March. He's the X factor for the Longhorns. Oh. Think about Dylan Dessou and how good he is, first-team All-Big 12. Think about Max A. Smith, how good he's been, second-team All-Big 12. Tyrese Hunter has been so up and down this year, he has to be great. Yep. Him in that Oklahoma game, he was terrific. Gives me 30 points, and then he comes back with a basically an 0-for performance against Kansas State. He can't afford to do that, and just his intensity – defensively that does set the tone but when he's knocking down his shot when he's getting to the paint and kicking guys out to the cutting Kendall Weaver or cutting Dylan Mitchell Caden Shedrick that's when the horns are playing their best ball and if number four isn't ready to play it's going to be a quick out for the Longhorns. 
Yes. Man, I'm more scared of that than I would be saying Candyman in the mirror five times. <laughs> you tell me that Tyrese Hunter is the X factor for this Yo, team? I, he loves March, even though he struggled uh, against Kansas State. Going back to his Iowa State yeah. days, he loves March. That's why Chris Beard and Ronnie Terry went after him. And last year he was good at this time of the year. He was. He was really good. He wasn't dropping 30 or, you know, averaging 20 assists or anything. But overall, he was solid. And his defense is key. If you add that with Kendall Weaver, which if I'm Rodney Terry, yeah, I, I guess I like the way IT Horton has been playing as of late. But come on, man. Kendall Weaver, only 10 minutes in the Kansas State game. RT can't have any of those lumps. He yep. can't have any of those Oh, I'm just not thinking of all the matchups that we could possibly put out there because Texas, they should be so versatile when it comes to matchups. If you play a bigger team, you could throw Caden Shedrick and Dylan DeSue out there as your big man, maybe Brock Cunningham or maybe Dylan Mitchell as your three to go along with those guards and Ace Mess and Hunter. Or if you play a smaller team that's quicker, put the Sioux at your five, put Brock Cunningham at your four, put Weaver, Ace Miss, and Tyrese Hunter as your guards. Like you can mix it up with this ball club and you've seen Rodney Terry do it at times but at, at other times you're like all right coach Terry when teams are going on the run like a Kansas State when you were up by 10 at half or like a Baylor like when you were up by 14 you got to be able to slow the game down and make those changes to the other coaches changes that's the key to March you got to be adjusting on the fly you don't have much time after you win to prepare for the next game until the next weekend yep. and the best coaches thrive at that you're right. You're right. And uh, it's big for Rodney Terry. And I, I like what you said about Tyrese Hunter, too. I mean, he has been great in the month of March. That's why what happened in the Big 12 tournament was so frustrating, right? He goes for 30 against OU. And then in the post game, he's talking about how, oh, this is March. This is when I need to be playing my best ball. And this is what I do this time of the year. And then literally three days later, still in the month of March, if memory serves, against yeah. K-State in Texas's first postseason game, obviously one that doesn't mean as much as the other postseason games they're about to play. He goes 0 of 7 and scores just three points against K-State. So which version of Tyrese Hunter are you going to get? The good news is Texas has two stars, right? right? And Dylan Sue and Max Aceman. Now, Dylan sue has got to stay healthy, number one, and that's why, yeah, this week plus off that Texas has had, that's a good thing for a guy who's battling a bum knee right now. That's great. He also has to stay out of foul trouble. Right. Like you look at Texas's last two losses, the Baylor game, Dylan the Sioux left with injury, but he also was dealing with a stomach bug. So he didn't play that much. You saw Texas fall apart without him. Obviously, up in uh, Kansas City, Texas had a 10 point halftime lead against K State. Dylan the Sioux picks up some early questionable fouls in the second half. He has to miss. He only plays 23, 24 minutes. And then Texas gives up that big lead. So he's got to stay out there. But we saw how good Texas was last year with Dylan the Sioux. We saw how good he was in the month of March. He's the type of guy that can carry this team. And Max Asmus, I mean, we haven't seen it at Texas, but we saw it at Oral Roberts, right? Like as a 15 seed, I mean, he led Oral Roberts to a huge upset a few years ago. This guy's a top 10 leading scorer in the history of men's college basketball. You've got two guys who are studs and who can put the team on their back. And sometimes they, in March, look, you need more than just two, obviously. You can't go two on five. But sometimes this time of year, you just need a guy or two to carry the team. And the good news is Texas has two players who are proven in this month who have shown you that they can do that. And that uh, could help Texas make a deeper run than I think some people are expecting. Yeah, absolutely. If you think about Max Aismas, and he went on a little bit of a slump in the Big 12 towards the end. And Rodney Terry did a good job of getting the ball out of his hands at times and putting in Tyrese Hunter so Max Aismas could come off screens and do some off-ball stuff. They kind of got him going. Look for that and whoever they play in their first round matchup because you need that dude scoring. Sometimes when you're playing point guard and the ball's in your hands and you're bringing it up the court, you're worried about all the point guard responsibilities. Do I got to get these guys in our offense? Do I have to kick it to, you know, in this certain play, et cetera. When you're off ball and your number one option is to score, it allows him to get back in his bag and do those types of things. And you think about Dylan DeSue, he could be unstoppable. Yeah. You know, think about if they had that matchup against Purdue. If that were to happen, Zach Eady would be his matchup. So Zach Eady, a guy that doesn't want to come out the paint, a guy that's 7'4", if he's guarding Dylan DeSue, who can shoot that three, that's advantage Texas. Yep. I like that matchup there. Now, guarding Zach Eady on the other side, he could easily go for 35 and 15. So you hope that Rodney Terry would be ready to double him. 
But at the end of the day, they got guys, as you said, that can create and get their own shot and can go off. And in the tournament, that's what you need. But if Dylan Mitchell's not ready to play, if he's going to be inconsistent like he's been all year, if Tyrese Hunter's going to be inconsistent, IT Horton, Caden Shedrick, they need all those guys to step up. And if those guys step up, which we've seen at times, yep. then, again, the Horns, they can make a run and surprise a lot of people. I'll say this, Zay. I don't think all of those guys need to step up. I think if two of the other guys can play well, Texas can beat just about anybody in the country. For sure. I really believe that. Obviously, it's better if all of the role players are on on the same night, but that's probably not going to happen. That's just not how college basketball works. I expect the Sioux and Acemas to do their things. I know Acemas was in a little bit of a shooting slump down the stretch of the regular season, but I feel good about him at this time of the year. I feel great about Dylan Dessou. He's the best player on this squad. I think everybody else does too. But if two of the other guys can just give you something, I think this Texas team can be good. The problem is you have nights where none of those guys are good or just one of those guys actually steps up and does their job. And you go back to that uh, K-State game, right? I mean, Tyree Sunder had three points. I think Brock Cunningham had nothing. Kendall Weaver had four points. I mean, you just didn't get enough – from those other players. If the Sioux and Acemas do their thing and multiple other guys step up for Texas, that's when we've seen this team play at its best. And that's where, yeah, if you do run into a number one seat, the good news is you don't have to play Houston, right? You're not going to be in the same right. region as Houston because they split things up by conference in the first two rounds of the tournament. So you're talking about playing a UConn. You're talking about playing a North Carolina. You're talking about playing a Purdue. Texas, I think, has shown at times this year they can run with teams like that, but they just need their role players to step up and do their jobs. They don't Tyrese Hunter doesn't have to go for 30. If he goes for 15 and plays the elite defense that he know that we know he's capable of, that's good. If that happens and Dylan Mitchell goes for 12 and 9 and plays his good defense, then I think that's enough for Texas to make it to the second weekend. They just can't have one of those games where it's Desu goes for 18 and 10, Acemas goes for 16, and everybody else gives you jack. If that happens, then they could lose to a nine seed in the first round. Oh, easy. And that's why Rodney Terry is so important for him to have a good feel for the yeah. game. I thought in the Kansas State game, he just didn't have a good feel because if you look at the minutes that were given out, Tyrese Hunter, who struggled and only had three points, went 0 for 7 from the field, 0 for 4 from the three-point line. He had 28 minutes while Kendall Weaver only had 10. Like, you got to throw Kendall Weaver in and let him mix it up. Like, that Kansas State game where Tyler Perry was going off hitting those Steph Curry range threes, you got to have a guy that could get out on that and, you know, it's in the rhythm of the game. We don't know that because you didn't give Kendall Weaver a chance. Yeah. So, yes, I know you want IT Horton to, you know, pick his game up. He's been struggling all year long, and it was promising to see him get 14 against Kansas State and hit some threes. Like, IT Horton, you're going to have to stretch the floor a little bit, especially if Max Aismas gets doubled coming off those balls screens or ice or Dylan Dessou gets double teamed in the post when he's trying to work out. you got to be able to knock down those outside shots. We know Kendall Weaver doesn't want to take them. We know Dylan Mitchell doesn't want to take them. The guys that do, the Brock Cunningham, the Tyrese Hunters, the IT Hortons, they got to be ready to shoot. And if they knock down just a couple of shots, that's going to change the game and give the Horns the advantage. I'm terrified that IT Horton had his one good game in March. Why? We need that. Oh, we, oh of course we need it, but I'm worried he, ah, he had his game and Texas lost. It's the run. This is what he's been waiting for, man. He's been waiting for an NCAA yeah. tournament run. I don't know how many times he's been in it, going from Delaware to Pitt to UCF. He's been all over the place. I don't think he ever has. <laughs> hey, that, that might be a good thing. He yeah. might be licking his chops, thinking, okay, I've been waiting for this my whole career. Now it's time to step up, because as you said, nobody gives a damn about the regular season. It's all about what you do in March. It's like that in college basketball. It's like that in the NBA. It's like that in every professional sport. Yeah. Nobody cares about about what you do, you make your legacy in the postseason, and Texas, who's as versatile as anybody in the nation, has a chance to do that. I'm just glad he's not wearing long sleeves anymore. What you mean, along? You got to keep them arms warm, the shooting hands warm, man. That, that, so you can let that thing fly. That's the worst pit of all time. <laughs> I mean, look, I, I was no good at basketball, but I was way worse when I was wearing long sleeves. Like, I, yeah. I can't figure out how people wear long sleeves when they what, what about the Iverson shooting sleeve? It didn't work for me, but not wearing a shooting sleeve also <laughs> did not work for me, so I'm not sure. <laughs> But I don't, it just didn't impact the shot. You didn't play with long sleeves. I did not play with no. long sleeves. That is not my style. Even wearing short sleeves under the jersey would, would impact my game. Yeah. But long sleeves, what are we doing here? Yeah, yeah. I yeah. see a guy have a bad night shooting. It's like, dude, it's because you're literally wearing a jacket underneath your jersey. Like, <laughs> take that off 
and play basketball. What's going on here? Yo, he's got to find something. I get it. If you're having a shooting slumps, you'll try anything. You'll change your socks, change your draws. You'll start eating different. Like, yeah. you'll do whatever it takes to get that shooting slump, get out of that. So, long sleeves, whatever needed. I'm about it. If IT Horn could hit some shots, Give the man whatever he needs. Yeah, absolutely. All right, y'all can hit us up on the code of text line, 512-222-9328. Of course, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, the live chat is working. It's, I'm trying to figure out what's going on. I guess I can't lean forward. If I lean forward, we might have issues. Or it might be our intern, Brock's fault. He's not doing anything over there. Yeah, drinking St. Patrick's Day beer I know. We got, stuff. We got the good. green beer rolling. Oh, yeah, we're good. It tastes different, too. I don't know Does how to really? do this stuff. Yeah, I mean, it tastes good. People say it's just food color, and I don't think so, man. I think it's its own beer right here. I'm going to find a leprechaun somewhere out here. I don't see Bucky, though. He's the, oh, he's the black on. leprechaun. Well, he's got the height to be the leprechaun, right? He's he not might, the biggest guy. He might be too tall to be a leprechaun, honestly. Oh, the way that his back is hunched, uh, he might go as a leprechaun. Nowadays. Yeah, that might work. Get out here to Crown and Anchor Pub. We'll be here till 6. Once again, the bracket is revealed in a little more than 20 minutes. About to hook us up with a TV right in front of us. About a personal TV for us to see what's going on. And, of course, we'll react in real time. Let me ask you this, A. I, I won't ask you for specific teams. If you want to give them, go ahead. But we'll start with uh, the positive, and then we'll go to the negative. What, what type of matchup would be the most beneficial for Texas? Like, what, what type of team that they could go up against that you would feel good about the matchup if, uh, you know, if things work out for the Longhorns when these brackets come out? Um, I would be terrified of a dominating big. Okay. Let's say if they had to play an NC State who has DJ Burns. That guy big is old huge. Yo, like Zach Randolph. Yeah. And I think he might have big Zebo by at least 30 pounds. That dude has footwork. Like, you don't want Dylan Basu to be in that. That matchup and Rodney Terry has oddly shown that he doesn't like double teaming bigs. You go back to that Kansas game, they didn't double team Hunter Dickerson really at all until Hunter Dickerson already had around 16 points or so, and by then everybody else was getting going. So I would not like a dominant big that would be the best player of that team. I would like it to be guards because the Horns, their best defenders are guards and Tyrese Hunter and Kendall Weaver. So I would want that to be. The horns matchup, but yeah. no matchup is good for Texas, to be honest. When it comes uh, defensively, I mean, going back to just their play, you know, in the Big 12, they get in foul trouble a little bit too much. Now, the Big 12 officials were a little suspect this year, a lot horns, of suspects, yeah. And we know the conspiracy theory there going to the SEC, we saw it in football too. But still, you got to be able to be disciplined and not bite on pump fakes, you know, not give up different layups and easy shots or not give up fast break layups. The Horns do that a lot, you know, yep. where they'll just get beat up the court, bad communication and stuff. Those things cannot happen. You cannot give up three points, and you got to make it a half-court game because, again, when you're in the tournament, people get tight. Teams get tight. Like, that half-court game, it's, it gets a little bit different when you know what's at stake. So I think the Horns' defensive matchups, it's going to be interesting to see. But, again, they're as talented as anybody in the nation, and if they get a good matchup, if RT gets a good coaching matchup, who knows? Yeah, defending without fouling I think is a key for Texas. You know, I keep harkening back to the most recent losses for this team, K-State and Baylor. Big stories in the second halves of both of those games was Texas just couldn't stop fouling. Once again, a lot of the officiating was suspect, but Baylor shot 40-plus free throws, and once again, Dylan DeSue picking up three pretty early fouls in the second half completely changed that game. It felt like K-State was in the bonus six or seven minutes in to the second half last Wednesday. So uh, that's key. And that's been an issue for Texas all year long, especially away from the Moody Center, defending without fouling. Obviously, they're done playing games in Austin this year. Can they find a way to do that? And, and you talk about Rodney Terry. Like one thing, one thing that has bothered me about RT this year, Guy picks up a second foul and they're on the bench for the rest of the half. I mean, Texas is 297th in the country in two foul participation. Like, Dylan DeSue, foul out. If Dylan DeSue's got a foul out, go down swinging, right? Don't die. What does Chip always say? Die on your shield. Yeah. Don't, don't die <laughs> on your knees. Sword, like, yeah. I don't, if Dylan DeSue picks up two fouls five minutes in to Texas's round of 64 game, you know, a lot of coaches would be like, well, we got to arrest him for the second. He's got to play. Like, yeah. sit him on the bench for a couple of minutes, but you cannot sit him for the rest of the half, let the other team go on like a 10-0 run, 15-0 run, something like that, that puts your team in a bad spot. 
you got to be willing, even if your best players are in foul trouble, you got to trust this is one of the most experienced teams in the country. They haven't always looked like it at times. But you talk about the age of this Texas team with all the fifth-year and six-year guys, all the grad transfers on this roster. This is one of the most experienced rosters in the NCAA tournament. you got to trust in your players to not pick up that big third foul in the first half, to not pick up that fifth foul in the second half. You cannot just say, oh, I'm worried, I'm scared that they're going to pick. No, you got to go down on your shield. That is something Rodney Terry hasn't done that much this year. Regular season, you can live with it. If it's a tournament game and Dylan DeSue's only playing 23 minutes because he gets into early foul trouble, I'm going to lose my mind because that's going to cause Texas to bow out earlier than they maybe should. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, Dylan DeSue, he has to be smart. He knows if he gets that first foul, you got to start olaying guys. I mean, yep. it might suck to start giving up layups, but that's Rodney Terry's job to put them in defensive situations to protect them. Maybe if somebody's going at Dylan DeSue, send that other guy over for a double team so that person can get the ball out of their hands so Dylan DeSue doesn't pick up that foul but if he does get it you're right you gotta let it roll at times i think it's trust in the bench more than that player that okay. might get into foul trouble i think he looks at guys like Caden shedrick or brock cunningham and thinks that oh I, these guys can come in and they'll do just fine they you know they won't give the lead up much if they do to where dylan desu our best players will come back in, in the second half and be able to perform without thinking so i don't necessarily think it's Rodney terry not trusting those guys as much as him trusting the bitch guys which I might not be the right decision yeah. at times. I mean, again, Caden Shedrick, he's come along as of late. He's played a lot better. But, man, we know once his back starts hurting and stuff, and you might have to go to Zerik Oyema. Oh, Lord. You, woo, once you see Zerik Oyema go out there, you might as well chalk it up as an L. Because I as say. I saw him out there against Kansas State, and you're just kind of like, well, this is it. He only played <laughs> two minutes in that yeah, that's game. That's it. That's it. It, it. it was the longest two minutes of my life. He had, like, a goaltending yep. in that two minutes. He, he did uh, get to the line and make two free throws. But he had a goaltend. He had a foul. I think he uh, fell down three times in the span of two minutes. It's like, you're right. If that guy is on the floor for any amount of time, but especially anything significant, then uh, that's a scary proposition for Texas. Yeah, and he had a lot of promise coming in. Who knows what – with the transfer portal, what's he going to do? What's that looking like? But, yeah, he just hasn't been what the Hornets thought he was going to be, you know. The, Monty Terry gives that Kenneth Faree comparison, which is nuts. I don't know. but you, Yeah, he said that during the year. He always likes to give these guys different NBA comparisons. Oh, yeah, man? Yes. Just because of the hair? I, just because they're dark skinned. Yeah. I don't know what it is. Because they're dark it's and like, they have <laughs> similar hair. So that, that's what we're doing here. Yo. That Kenneth Faree was known as the man. Yeah. He was an absolute stud for the Nuggets those few years, yeah, catching and lobs and being a defensive threat. Pulled off an upset in the tournament, right? Yeah, man. For my State. favorite college, Moorhead. Moorhead State. We yeah. all love Moorhead <laughs> State. One of yeah. our favorites. Unfortunately, they didn't make it this year. Mm. But, yeah, I don't think we've seen that Kenneth Faree type player this season, and I don't think we will. But – I've been saying, I've been telling Chip, and I've been saying on the program with TSU all year long, Coach Terry, you got to have an eight-man rotation if you want to be competitive. And he kind of has it, but not where you want it. I mean, yeah. that eight-man rotation, starting with Max Ace, Miss Kasu, Tyrese Hunter, Dylan Mitchell, Kate Cedric, IT Horton, Kendall Weaver, and Brock Cunningham, that's it. Those are the only guys that's should all you be need. That's all you need. Mm -hmm. Those are the only guys that you should be playing. Once Oyema or Chris Johnson starts coming in, again, you might as well chalk that up as an L. I don't think we're going to see those guys, but you never know. It's March Madness. Anything can happen. But, yeah, Dylan Dasu gets that second foul. Depending on where you're at, you might send them out for a little bit. But those last three minutes, put them back, put in. back in. Last three minutes of the first half, put them back in. He's going to have to Olay guys, but offensively, he's too good to not have them on the court. Moorhead State, not in the NCAA tournament, but Longwood is <laughs> in the big dance this year. There we go. What kind of school name is that? I mean, I'm glad it exists. That's an awesome university, and it would be great to say you graduated from Longwood, but that's a real thing? Longwood U? <laughs> Uh, they're letting fifth graders come up with these names for universities right now. That's absolutely insane. Uh, they'll probably be a 16 seed. By the way, uh, Scotty Scheffler is in the lead at the Players' Championship. There we go, represent. We, we got folks on YouTube giving us updates right now. Scotty Scheffler shot eight under today, 20 under for the championship. He's got a one-shot lead over Brian Harmon and Xander Shoffley, who are still on the course. So it uh, could be a really, really good day for the Longhorn. Scotty Scheffler, the world number one, playing out of his mind earlier today. So we'll keep you all posted with that. 
We also have the Mavs Nuggets going on right now. Mavs are about to blow a huge fourth quarter lead because they're really good at that this season. They're up four right now with three and a half minutes to go. We got some Spurs fans here. I didn't realize people were wearing Spurs jerseys in public right now with how bad the team has been. Is the game at the mood today? What's the game at the mood? At the mood. There was one on Friday. They played Denver, and they're playing – oh, somebody bad tonight. Who are they playing tonight, Manu? The Nets? Brooklyn Nets. Brooklyn Nets. Uh, Not bad. Yeah, two uh, title contenders this year. (laughs) Duking it out at Moody Center for sure. That will be a a great game. Hey, that Victor Wimbenyama, he's special. He is. He's my CTV. Oh, I've got to – as a Mavs guy, I've got to dunk on the Spurs while I can. Because my my, my whole childhood, they were amazing, and I couldn't talk any trash about them. And I know in like five years they're going to be amazing again, so I won't be able to talk any trash about them. So this little window right now where they're one of the worst teams in the league, I've got to take advantage of that. I've been waiting my whole life for this. I'm going to capitalize while I Yo, can. Yo, I dig it. Those Mavs, I've been riding that 2011 high for a long time. Yep. I get it. Man. Yeah, It was a good time, but it's been a hot minute since then. It's been a hot Going minute on since 13 then. years. It's been a hot minute since then. And now it's just like try to be in the playoffs and not to play in, please. That's the goal of the Mavs right now. It's uh, We'll see. NBA feels pretty open this year, especially in the West, but uh, we can talk about that for another day. All right, got about 15 minutes until the bracket comes out. I mentioned earlier, Joe Lenardi has Texas playing Dayton in an 8-9 game. Uh, Mike DeCourcy, who is Fox Sports' biggest bracketologist, he has Texas playing Northwestern in North Carolina's region. Bunch of journalists. I'll take that matchup. Yeah. Against Northwestern. Smart guys. And then CBS has Texas playing Colorado State. See, I, I prefer – I always prefer, and this could come back to Bobby, right? Texas could get a matchup against Dayton or Colorado State, and they could lose. But I, I want a smaller conference team in the first round if you can get one. Because those teams just haven't been through what Texas has been through. Now they've earned their spot. Their resume is good enough. Maybe they played some power conference teams in non-con, but that's you know back in December, right? Like Texas has gone up against tournament teams for the last three months. The Big 12 is going to get more teams in the dance than any other league in the sport. Talk about Colorado State. You talk about Dayton. Those are one, two, three bid leagues. They're not battle tested like Texas is. So if you're asking me if it's going to be a Nebraska or Northwestern uh, team like that, or it could be a team like Colorado State or Dayton or Boise State, give me a team like that instead because I would like Texas's chances just based on the type of talent that they've gone up against all season long. Yeah, I would like Nebraska, to be honest. I think Nebraska is a really good matchup oh. for the Longhorns. We got the, they got the Japanese Steph Curry, and he could really go. But I think Kendall Weaver would lock that stuff yeah. up. But I'm with you. You want one of those teams that's not in a Power Six conference that hasn't been battle tested or played the type of conference or level that the Horns have played all year long. And yeah, you could catch teams like that on uh, surprise, but. At the end of the day, when you're sitting at that 8 9 spot or that 7 10 spot, it's a flip of a coin. You yep. know? It's all about coaching and team preparation and just whatever team's filling it that day. I mean, that's what's lovely about this tournament. Like, teams, the best teams, you can have that off day and that be it. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Like, ask those U of H teams back in the 80s that had Olajuwon and Clyde Drexler. Those teams were always picked to win or get close. And, they would get surprised every once in a while. So you just never know when you're going to have your off night. And you got to hope that coaching and preparation that you did before the season, during the season, and now is paying off. Yeah, you and I differ on uh, the Nebraska take because I want nothing to do with Nebraska. That's my man. They say Tommy Naga. Yeah. Japanese, Japanese legend. Curry. Oh, my gosh. I don't want any part of that, dude. Yeah, man, that dude's nice. And also Fred Hoiberg scares me a little bit. Ah, uh, yeah, he can coach a little bit. It's taken the mayor a while to get things rolling in Lincoln, but I just harken back to his Iowa State days, and, man, Iowa State was always a problem. And they had some runs in March under Freddie Hoiberg. He tried his hand at the NBA level. It didn't work out. It wasn't working at Nebraska. Fans were starting to get a little restless. It kind of felt like a make-or-break year for him. And uh, Nebraska made a decent run in the Big Ten tournament. They had a pretty solid season. I don't want any part of those dudes, man. Because I, I want to, I want a coaching matchup, right? Like, I think Rodney Terry, for as much flack as he gets from Texas fans, he's still a good enough coach, and I'd feel good about him going up against a number of different guys, especially in the first round. Now, you talk about RT versus Kelvin Sampson. Talk about him against Matt Painter. Uh, you talk about him against Dan Hurley. Not so much. Most of the teams in that eight, nine, ten range, I'd feel good about RT going up against Fred Hoiberg. Uh, that, to me, that's a Hoiberg advantage when it comes to the sideline 
Yeah, there are certain guys that are just ready during this time of year. You mentioned Hoiberg, Tom Izzo, those guys get in. You always got to look out for him. Will Wade over that McNeese State. He had that bad moment over there with LSU, and now he's at McNeese State. And that team, they won 30-something games this year. And whoever they play in the first round, I, most likely they're going to pick them for an upset. But, yeah, there's just certain guys during this time of the year that the, – no matter what the team looks like, they're going to have their team prepared to play, and they're going to have you heavily scouted and making sure they just have a great game plan to stop what you do. And Fred Hoiberg, he's one of those guys with curry teriyaki. My God. Is that what we those, call That's him? what we call him, man. Throwing up those threes with the left. He said he idolized Steph Curry back in his days at Japan, and we're going to see him on the Japanese 2024 Olympic team. So, yeah, that, that's my guy. I, I would love to see that matchup. Horns and corn huskers going back to the old Big 12 days. And you see the tournament committee do stuff like that from time to time, right? Like they want those old school matchups. Look at last year, right? They were hoping for UT and AM oh, in the round praying. two. They right? were praying for it. Because AM was a seven seed and Texas was a two. Of course, AM couldn't get by Penn State in the first round because AM loses every big game that it plays in in every sport. We knew that was the case. And then Big Brother had to take care of business for Little Brother and beat Penn State. But you see stuff like that happen. So, yeah, Texas-Nebraska in around one with that old-school Big 12 rivalry. Hell, that was the Volleyball National Championship That's a couple right. of months ago. I don't know how much stock that will carry uh, with the NCAA Men's Basketball Tournament Committee. But uh, sometimes, yeah, you get those storyline-laden matchups when you get to this. So. Uh, that's that's uh, an interesting thought right there, and that could be a fun one. So, uh, yeah, Texas-Nebraska, a potential first-round matchup here. Less than 10 minutes away from the reveal of the bracket. I can't wait to see what happens. Yeah, you know, BK, yeah. Shaka Smart and Marquette, I think it's going to be very easy if Marquette goes down this year to blame Shaka Smart. Oh, you I know, will. I, <laughs> not understandable, but – if he doesn't have Tyler Kolick, which is arguably one of the top point guards in the nation who missed every Big East game in the big tournament, you know, it's okay. it, that's going to hurt. Yeah, like Tyler Kolick really makes them go. And they played hard against UConn yesterday, but you could tell they were missing the Southpaw guard. And if they don't have him or if he's not 100%, I could see the Golden Eagles losing in the second round easy. I think he's playing, right? Okay. I heard I heard in the Big East tournament final yesterday on the broadcast that Kolick is expected back for the big dance. So, yeah, he missed uh, the last five or six games for Marquette going in. Maybe he could have played yesterday, but obviously bigger fish to, uh, fish to fry for Marquette. But it doesn't matter if he plays or if he doesn't. Come they, on. They had him last year. They lost to the they, Yeah, but round. he wasn't as good. You know, when you when you lose, that makes a man. You know, that makes a person. You go back in the yeah. lab. You do things different. He probably changed his diet. He was probably getting up more shots, cracking in more film. Everybody on that Marquette team. You know, you saw what they did to the Longhorns this past year. You know, it's – that team is destined for greatness. It's just they have to be healthy. And I think Shaka Smart, a guy that's been to the Final Four before, obviously it wasn't with Texas. A long time it's ago. It's been a minute. It's been a minute. This is a team that fits his personnel and his philosophy more than it did in Austin when he yeah. was here. So, yeah, they're going to be a tough out no matter what. But Texas, or excuse me, <laughs> uh, Kyler Kolick. Yeah. He, they need him. They yeah, need that guy. I'll be picking against them in round two. Oh, come on. I can tell you that right now. And I'll be rooting against them, too, because that's what I do. I root against my exes, all right? Some people aren't willing to admit it. I'm willing to admit it. I hope they all fail miserably. I'm not rooting for Rick Barnes in this tournament. I'm not rooting for Shaka Smart in this tournament. Damn. Chris Beer's not even in this tournament. I sure as hell am not rooting for that guy. And I wouldn't even if he was in the dance. So I'm not rooting for Marquette. I hope they lose to whatever 15 seed they get in round one. That's is, that, cold. is that bad? <laughs> I feel you. Oh, I'm a piece of shit. You know. I'm yeah, 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 yeah. Everybody yeah, knows okay. that. Yeah. As long as you admit it, yeah. you know, I respect that. Look, Barnes did some really good things here. But, again, this time of the year, his teams just get tight. I yep. don't understand it. Like, go back to those teams of Marcus Aldridge and Ruby Gibson and P.J. Tucker. And, yeah, they went to the Elite Eight and stuff. But ain't no way that team should have lost to Big Baby Davis and Tyrus Thomas and stuff. Yep. They should have won that game. That was a Final Four caliber team. And it seems like these past few years when he had guys like Grant Williams playing for the Volunteers, he just couldn't get over that hump either. So now when you have a player like – connect that dude's an absolute star if you won't be able to get over the hump of somebody like him yep. then it ain't happening bro like this is the best year i think barnes is gonna get and 
hey, he has to make it count. I think Tennessee's the top five team in the country. But at this time of the year, I'm just not worried. Or I am worried about Rick Barnes and what he does in March. So – uh, regular season Rick, as they call him, he gets ner- he looks nervous. He looks nervous coaching these games. And I like think he'd be team- looking sickly and pale and stuff. I'm like, come on, Rick, gotta get some more colors or drink some water, something. Yep, yeah, more confident, something. This time of the year, man, he looks nervous, and I think that type of energy seeps into the rest of his team, and that's why, yeah, more often than not, uh, his teams and his fans leave more disappointed. Uh, than others. All right, a uh, couple minutes away before the bracket actually gets revealed. What are you looking for in the bracket reveal? Not just for Texas, but what are the biggest storylines for you as uh, we're about to find out what the ultimate field of 68 looks like? Uh, just kind of where your region is. I mean, UConn, they're going to be in Boston most likely, and that's going to pay uh, play to their advantage. U of H, they're probably going to be in the Dallas region. That's going to play to their advantage. They're going to travel well. And, you know, if you're U of H, one thing that you're looking at is Mattress Max pick. Because oh. we know oh, Mattress oh. Mac, he ain't the best gambler. He's picking UH. I'm that's not, you that's right what now. I'm saying. That yep. ain't good. I don't think that's oh, very good. Shit. That's that's one of those things. You know, again, I'm not stupid stitious and all, but there are certain things that you look at, and when it becomes a pattern, you're like, okay, you just can't get past certain things. Yep. Mattress Mac might be one of those things. So U of H, I love Jamal Shedd, Maynard kid with Shaka Smart. You deserve to get fired for not even crossing the yeah. tracks to go in the Maynard to recruit him. I don't give a damn if he's a three star or not. I recruited him. <laughs> I went even on the. I went to call his games in high school, and I was trying to get him to go to Texas. Why yeah. didn't I get that buyout money? You know, man, the dude's an absolute stud. Uh, but you fear with U of H. Do they have enough scoring to put them in the final four? Yep. Yes, their defense is good, but hey, your defense could be great. And if you're not scoring, you're going to look at the scoreboard. It's going to be halftime and it's going to be 25 22 or something like that. And by that time, it's anybody's game. So yep. U of H, you got to worry with that. But Jamal Shedd, he's the type of point guard that can lead you to a national championship because he's so dynamic offensively and defensively. 100%. All right. They turned us down here at Crown and Anchor because they're doing a raffle here. Pretty cool event. Pints and Puffs out here at Crown and Anchor Pub. Uh, they've been selling raffle tickets all day long, and they're about to announce the winners right here. But, of course, if you're still on YouTube or on the TSU app, you can uh, catch us right now. And uh, we've got the TV in front of us. So we will find out when you people find out what this bracket is going to look like. We'll give you some updates as Zay drops the phone. Are we okay there? Oh, yeah, we're good. You got we're the good. case on that thing? Oh, yeah, I always got to have the case. Case, screen protector, the whole nine. I'm too clumsy for that BS. I don't even leave the Verizon store without a case on my phone. Oh, yeah, you like, got to. I, I can't raw dog the phone. Well, that sounds weird. But I can't. No, you can't raw dog the phone. Can't, no, can't it's it. too risky. Too big of a risk. It's too big of a risk. Too much. Oh, yeah. And I've just hit a buzzer beater. Is that what happened over there? Was it Kyrie? Was it Kyrie? Was it Kyrie? Wow. See, uh, see, look at that. Hey, maybe the earth maybe the earth is flat. Maybe that guy's on to something. Look at that, wow. man. Maybe we're uh, doubting Kyrie Irving a little bit too much. That's what I'm saying, man. You're Jewish, too. Come on, now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I respect him. That's all right. If he keeps hitting shots like that, I'll forgive all the other stuff that he's putting everybody through. Big win for the Mavs over the defending champion Denver Nuggets. All right. Uh, the CBS Bracket Show has started. I don't think we'll be able to pipe in the sound to you people, but we'll be able to react once again in real time. Final pick for Texas. Zay, what seed and what region do you think the Longhorns will uh, will be in um, it happens. I would say they're going to be in eighth seed. Uh, the region, I'm going to say they're going to be West. They're going to be West. Okay. I don't know where that is. You don't know where place. West is? Well, I know where West is. Okay. I don't know where they be in, you know, Arizona. No, that's the final four. What part of California, Oregon, Washington State? That, that's where I'm at. Like, where where are those games going to be played? Yeah, the, uh, the West Regional is in L.A. at the Crypt, Crypto.com Arena. So if Texas does make it to weekend two, uh, that's where they'll be playing. Also, you've got – I mean, there's no way they, they'll put Texas in the south. But, no. Because that's where Houston's going to be. Yeah. you got some Sweet 16 and Elite Eight games in Dallas at the AAC okay. here in a couple of weeks. So a lot of Kooks fans will be making that trip if Houston is able to get – into weekend two. I'm with you on the eight seed though. Like I saw some bracketologists put Texas as a nine. The only difference between an eight and a nine is the color jersey that you wear in that first round matchup. Right. But the bracket matrix, this is my favorite site this time of year. It compiles every single bracketology out there. It's got Texas as an eight seed. So ultimately, 
I do think Texas will be an eight. And we find out right now the first team revealed in the NCAA tournament field of 68, the UConn Huskies. You called it, Zay, the defending champs. Uh, no surprise. I mean, they ran through the Big East this year, 31-3 and three on the season. They won the Big East regular season and tournament title. Once Houston lost to Iowa State, I think it set it in stone that UConn was going to be the number one overall seed. Hard to argue with uh, what they've been able to pull off. Very hard. I mean, again, Dan Hurley, this is basketball legacy. Going to his yeah. brother Bobby, his father, Bobby Hurley Sr., was an absolute legendary coach in the New Jersey high school area. And Dan, he's making the name for him, his own self, winning it last year. And that that's the thing. Like, when you win a national championship, you're supposed to have a huge turnover because a lot of those guys are moving on to the association like they did. You think about their big last year, Adama Sonogo, he's gone. I already mentioned Andre Jackson, who plays for the Bucks. Yep. You think about Jordan Hawkins, who plays for the Pelicans. All those guys were so huge in them winning and winning a championship last year, but you got Tristan Newton, who's an absolute star and might be the best player in the Big East. They got Cam Spencer, who, a lot like Jordan Hawkins last year, is a huge three-point threat, and then you got Donovan Klingon. Oh, who, you can't guard that You can't guard him. He's their X-Factor. He's been up and down all year long due to injuries but him at 7-2 that's why if they faced off against the Purdue in the final four you give UConn the advantage because they have better guards and they have somebody that can match up with Zach Eady pretty well so yeah Connecticut they're absolutely gonna just dominate this tournament it seems like a lot like they did last year. So good news bad news uh, the good news is Texas is not in the same region as UConn unless there are seven we'll see but yeah. the eight and nine is Florida Atlantic and Northwestern so uh, it, if Texas is an eight or a nine seed, they will not be having to potentially face UConn in round two. That's the good news because UConn's the defending champs. They're the number one overall seed. They're better this year than they were last year. Remember, they won it all as a four seed a season ago. They just got hot at the right time. This year, they've been hot all season long. The bad news, though, Zay, I don't know if, if you know this stat or if you heard me talk about this on the shows this week. Only two of the last 15 defending national champs have made it to the Sweet 16. Wow. How crazy is that? So I wouldn't bet against UConn in the first weekend, but Kansas last year, the defending champs, they were a one seed. They lost in the second round to Arkansas. So you talked about it earlier. Nobody has repeated as a national champ since Florida back in 06, 07. It's only happened like twice in really the last 40 years. You go back to Duke in the early 90s. They're the other team to do it. But it's, it's almost been a curse to be the defending champs right there. Moorhead State made it. We I didn't know wrong. they made it. We were wrong. Moorhead and Longwood. <laughs> <laughs> Both in the NCAA tournament this year. Does it get any better than that? Uh, Moorhead State will be playing against Illinois in Yo, the first round. Shout out to Illinois winning the Big Ten tournament. They're a solid team. Terrence Shannon Jr. It seemed like he's been playing college basketball for eight years now, going back to his days with Chris Beard and Lubbock playing for Texas Tech, now playing for Brad Underwood in Illinois. He's a star, man. That dude, he's gotten so much better than what he used to be. He used to be a guy that, you know, was really athletic. He's a Southpaw guy, but he used to just settle too much. Yep. Now he doesn't settle. He's could always get into the rim, and he's a big-time three-point threat shooting at 36%. So if you look at him, 22 points a game, that dude, he's a guy, type of guy that can lead a team like Illinois, maybe pass ooh. a UConn if they get that matchup. But, ooh, man. Iowa State. I, that's a little cold-blooded. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think that's right, BK. I think that's cold-blooded putting Iowa State in the same side as UConn. By the way, way advice for Terrence Shannon, stay away from the boom boom in Lawrence, Kansas, all right? That's uh, <laughs> advice for him. That is one thing him and I have in common, though. No allegations against me. I just want that on the record. But hey, man. I have been in that uh, in that same place, and, boy, it's a good time. Hey, I feel him. It's aptly named. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. Iowa State a two seed. So you and I both said earlier we think the Cyclones should have been the fourth number one seed. It's clear that they're not that. But not only are they a number two, they're in UConn's region? I, I don't understand. That's what it. they get for winning the Big 12 tournament title by 30 against the number one team in the country? Yeah, I really don't understand oh. that. Like, I, it seems like they're downplaying the Big 12. I, I don't know. Like, you can't beat a team the caliber of Houston the way that you did to win it all and then basically be that they're the eighth team. In all of the uh, uh, bracket. Yep. Like, that's what it means. When you're playing that number one seed or the over, number one overall seed, it means that 
you're that eighth spot. So they should have been that f- uh, fifth spot yeah. playing the worst number one seed. I know that's an oxymoron, but I thought they would be really battling for that number one seed with North Carolina winning the Big 12 championship. That's a head scratcher to me. It is. And, you know, sometimes with teams five through eight, they try to do it regionally. So I don't think they were going to send Iowa State out west, even though – they might have been the number five overall seed, but still putting them with UConn, that feels unfair. I mean, put them with Purdue or something, right? Yeah. If you're going to keep them on the right side of the country, then uh, yeah, keep them uh, again away from UConn. I'll tell you what, as we go full Clark Kellogg and Jay Wright and was it Seth Davis, who's the other guy? That yeah, was, yeah, good crew. Okay. I saw Wally Zerbiak, Wally World, who's high on Texas. So there we go. I'm messing with Wally this year. Well, he's high on something if he's uh, high on Texas. <laughs> I could tell you that, but uh, I like Auburn. Me too. Like uh, Auburn's a four seed. And once again, they're in the same region as UConn. So I can't imagine a lot of people are going to pick Auburn to win against UConn in a potential Sweet 16 matchup. But I think Auburn's a legit national title contender. I really do. They made it to the Final Four with Bruce Pearl a couple of years ago. They were a a very questionable, boneheaded foul away from playing for the national title against Texas Tech and that Chris Beard team back in 2019. They fouled Ty Jerome. They were up by two. Jerome was shooting a three. They fouled him. He made all three free throws in the final second, and that was the end of the run for Auburn. I feel like that's a team coming off that SEC tournament championship today. Now that's that is a team that could give UConn a scare and maybe have the Huskies bound out earlier than they want. Yeah, and they also have one of the most underrated coaches in the nation in Bruce Pearl. One guy. of us. <laughs> yeah, oh. one of us, right? He's a uh, you know, type of guy that say what you want about him. He's been through some controversy at times at his previous stops, but he loves his players. He was tearing up when they were – locked in to win that oh. game today versus Florida because he knows he has a squad that plays really hard and fights just like he does. And he just lost his pops in August. So, you know, he has a lot to play for. And so do his guys led by Broom, the big man who lights get in front of who's really good. He man. can hoop. He could definitely hoop. And they gave Florida everything they wanted today, winning the SEC championship, which – you know, if you think about Texas, obviously in football, we're very excited for the Horns going to the SEC. But basketball, it ain't going to be no slouch. It ain't going to be no joke. I mean, again, you got Chris Beard at Old Miss. Barnes always does well at Tennessee, even though he's not the best in the tournament. We just mentioned Auburn. you got to face Calipari in Kentucky. South Carolina's better this year. The SEC, I think it's going to get eight teams in. It's the second-best league in the sport this oh, year. Oh, easily. It's not yep. even close. Yep, so it'll be a little bit of a reprieve for Texas making the move, but it's not like they're, uh, they're going to the 8-10 of the Missouri Valley or anything like that. They're going to have to uh, still bring it just about every night if they want to be successful in the SEC. I'll tell you what, you know, it, with the World Cup, they do the group of death. That's what they call it. They're like the toughest draw for World Cup teams. This is the region of death. I'm looking at Ken Palm right now. Three of the top five teams on Ken Palm are in the same region. UConn's number one. Auburn, a four seed, is number four. Iowa State is number five. You got three of the five best teams, according to Ken Pomeroy, in the exact same region uh, they're almost like trying for UConn not to go back to back. It's almost like, hey, if you guys are legit, you want to prove that you're one of those rare teams that actually can win two in a row, you're going to have to earn it because this is about as tough of a path as you could possibly give them. And then it goes back to why is Iowa State here? Yep. I mean, you saw Iowa State on TV when it showed. like Those guys didn't look very excited for that number two spot. I think they were really banking on maybe getting the number one overall seed or at least being on that same side as North Carolina if they got to be a number one seed because they match up way better with North Carolina than they do Connecticut. So I don't know. Somebody on Iowa State must have said something crazy about somebody on the committee's mama or something because <laughs> yep. this is just uh, it's preposterous to me. Like Iowa State was so good in the Big 12 terms. They were so good all year long. You mentioned how they played one of the most quad one schedules in the nation and I'm one of the best records against quad one teams in the nation. Now the South's coming out with U of H being number one. We knew that was going to happen. Yep. But, yeah, the Cyclones, they got a horrible draw, and it might cost them from making the Final Four appearance. Houston, the number one seed in the South. If Texas is an eight or a nine, they will not be in this region. So uh, Longhorn fans might have to wait a little bit longer to hear their name called. Interesting, though, Houston's the number two, number one seed. Not that this matters too much, who's the number two, number one, or the number three, number one. But I think a lot of people expected Purdue to be that uh, number two, number one. And how about this for Houston? They get to go up against Longwood. Yep. Uh, 
I got to be careful with how I phrase this here. I was going to say I always root for Longwood, but I'm not sure I want that on my ledger. Uh, Houston will go up against Longwood. You've got Moorhead State and Longwood. All we need is Oral Roberts, and then we'd have the trifecta of hilarious college basketball program names. Uh, I don't think ORU is in this thing this year. There you go. AM is in the dance as a nine seed. So Nebraska versus Texas AM. Uh, scratch off both the Huskers and the Aggies as a potential first round opponent for the Longhorns. We talked about Nebraska a little bit earlier. I thought AM had a chance to be playing in Dayton in one of those first four games. They're running the SEC tournament, I guess, enough to put them in the dance and not in that first four. They get to go up against Nebraska, and the reward for those teams is having to go up against that Houston defense. Yeah, that defense, one of the best in the nation. Kelvin Sampson does a great job of just getting hard-nosed guys. They might not be five stars. They might not be blue-chip McDonald's All-American players, but they fit the culture and they fit what he likes to do, which is be physical. And that's the thing. That's the question with Houston moving on. Are they just too physical and too you know, much of a defensive-focused team to advance? Because you know you're going to need offense at some point. I think LJ Cryer and Emmanuel Sharp have to be huge. You know what Jamal Shedd's going to give you, but Jamal Shedd's an all-around point guard. Yes, he has to score at times, but he wants to get guys involved more and let his defense do the talking and his leadership guide the Cougars to dubs, while LJ Cryer has to knock down outside shots. Emmanuel Sharp has to knock down outside shots. If they don't, you can see the Houston Cougars making an early exit. Mm, how about Duke, the four seed in this South region? I can see a lot of folks picking the Duke over Houston upset. I'm here to tell you right now, kids, it's not going to happen. I don't think so. Either. Don't waste your time there. Duke the four seed. Uh, James Madison, the former president, still alive? <laughs> Hooping. They're the 12 seed going up against Wisconsin there, so that's an interesting draw. I'll tell you what, Zay, I, I don't know who my national champ is going to be when I fill out my bracket, but I have picked Houston to win it all the last two years, and they've let me ah. down. I don't know if I should keep picking them. Well, you were living in Houston, so that, that's different. I would have done that regardless. Oh, okay. And, and this year I feel even better about their chances because they played in a real conference this year. That 6-11 matchup might be the matchup of the tournament. Texas right Tech. Now. Right, right, as of right now, Texas Tech 6, North Carolina State 11. Oh, I'm picking the Wolfpack. I'm picking the Wolfpack, I'm too. I'm telling you I, right now. I – those guys, man, the way that they balled, and you're going to have to be a little nervous about how healthy they are. Yep. Like, man, this South is ridiculous with Kentucky number three. But going back to the Wolf Pack, like winning five games in five days to win the ACC tournament was so impressive. And you think about DJ Burns, who we mentioned, has that Zach Randolph game. He's a lefty. And then, you know, the other DJ that they got, the guard, he's an absolute – DJ Horn, he's yep. an absolute oh, score. He was incredible oh, yesterday. He was terrific shooting those floaters from a line, like right inside the three-point line and stuff. Like that's going to be a really tough matchup for Texas Tech, who is led by Pop Isaacs. Yeah. Boy, Kevin Keats maybe saved his job with the week that he yep. just had at NC State. That guy went from the hot seat to uh, maybe buying himself a couple more years. I think actually in his contract, he did have a clause in there that says if he made the tournament this year, he got two more years added to the end of his deal. <laughs> That's what it's about. So there's a few more milli going into Kevin Keats' pocket right there. All right, we've got our first Dayton game, Boise State and Colorado. So those are uh, two of the last four teams in Colorado lost the Pac-12 tournament final to Oregon yesterday. They still make it to the dance. Boise State, who well, I had seen bracketologies with them as high as a seven, said they're a 10, and they've got to go to Dayton. It feels like Boise State has played in the first four like six times already. And, oh, I'd like to congratulate the University of Houston on a trip to the final four. Oh, come on. Because the two seed in their region is Shaka Dumb and Marquette. Congrats <laughs> to Houston. They've got the easiest path to a final four I think I've ever seen. Yeah, you know, Marquette, obviously Shaka Smart has had his difficulties in the last few years in the tournament, especially with the Horns and this past year with Marquette. But like we mentioned earlier, Tyler Kolick is the key to their team. He is their best player, and he has to be healthy if they want to make a run. You know, a couple of teams that could possibly come out that South region besides Houston, Wisconsin. Don't sleep on them. Yeah, and Wisconsin had a really good showing in the Big Ten tournament, beating Purdue. Like, if you beat Purdue, you probably feel like you could beat anybody. If you could ride that momentum, I know they lost against Illinois in that tight battle for the title today, but you, know, you cannot count Wisconsin out. And if they advance and Duke advances, that would be a really good matchup in the round of 32. It absolutely would be. Yeah, Duke's one of those hit-or-miss teams. I mean, they've got the talent every year. We're still trying to figure out who John Shire is as a coach, right? I mean, Duke, 
you know, Texas football feels like a disrespectful comparison to Duke, right? Like Texas football is always going to recruit well. Charlie right. Strong recruited well. Tom Herman recruited well. They just couldn't develop and turn that talent into success when it mattered most. Duke's been recruiting like crazy. They got Cooper Flag coming in. I mean, they're going to have another amazing recruiting class in 2025. But hey, can they win in the tournament? I mean, Coach K won five national titles. Like he always went on deep runs. John Shire made it to a Final Four couple of years ago, but Duke lost to their biggest rival, North Carolina, who was an eight seed. And then, that was a Coach K team. That was his last team. That was his last team. That I was beg his last pardon. team. I beg your pardon. But, uh, yeah, John Shire so far in the dance. I guess one year, not a great showing last year. Can I mean, Duke basketball fans, they don't have much patience. Can Duke make that deep tournament run this year? Uh, John Shire is not going to get fired if things go poorly this year. But if Duke loses to Wisconsin in that potential second-round game, there's going to be a lot of questions about uh, whether or not he – is the right answer long term for the Blue Devils? Yeah, and I think he's there for a while. I mean, they're going to give him time. Not everybody could be the greatest coach in college basketball history, and Mike Shashevsky. But you look at John Shire, like he's Duke royalty, or Duke royalty, excuse me. That guy won a national championship when he was at Duke. You know, when you're that guy that's been an assistant for Coach K for all those years, they're going to give him time, and he's doing a hell of a job when it comes to recruiting. But can he do a good job from game to game? in the tournament i mean losing to north carolina twice yeah. that's not good you gotta at least get one of them a season yep. you can't lose to the tar heels twice that never looks good but if they could put up a run they still got the talent in slapowski and roach and i can't Aaron believe philipowski's okay by the way oh that dude My come on God. give me a break. i thought he was gonna need knee replacement surgery give me a break and then he's out here tripping guys and stuff like that yeah. in the north carolina game he's doing like, a windmill dunk at the end of the game three days later and it's like everyone acted like he was going to be a paraplegic for the rest of Yo, his life. I don't know what it is. If you're Caucasian and you play at Duke, you're going to be dirty somehow. Yep. I don't know what it is. It's just a part of that DNA. Going back to Christian Leitner, you know, you think about Grayson Allen, Wojo, like the list goes on. And you know, we probably can even count Shane Batty in say. that crew. He's lighting up He's... to be part of those <laughs> dirty Duke teams. But yep. yeah, man, they're going to have a couple. And Filipowski, he definitely fits the mold quite easily. It's rite of passage. Right of if you're passage. a white guy at Duke, you got to cause all sorts of problems. Now, you're usually good, too. Like, yeah, yeah, usually can play. Yeah, you're yeah. not just like the 10th guy off the bench who comes in and commits a flagrant foul. You're not. Brock Cunningham, no offense to Brock. You know, you're usually an all-American caliber player, but also you got a little nastiness in you. And uh, yeah, Filipowski's got some of that this year. Thank God he's okay. I mean, someone let Jay Billis know he's he's all right. <laughs> By Jay Billis saying no one should be allowed to storm the court ever again in college basketball. Even though Filipowski actually initiated that contact. Yeah, yeah, he definitely like Caden Clark did too. Yep. And you think about you know. You mentioned Brock Cunningham. Yeah. And Brock has been really solid in the Big 12, knocking down shots and just being physical. We know that he did some dirty play and stuff, whatever. The Horns need that at times. But sometimes Brock needs to be smart. But the reputation fouls oh, yeah. that he gets, it's not only Brock Cunningham. It's starting to move on to the whole Texas team. Like, that Kendall Weaver play where he basically trips oh, Tyler Perry God. at clutch time, like, that's a reputation foul. That's a, oh, this Texas team, they've known to do stuff dirty because they got Brock Cunningham. So anytime we get into those iffy situations, we're not going to give them the benefit of the doubt. Look out for that during the tournament. We saw tournament. that last year in the NCAA tournament against Miami. Like Brock Cunningham had a great box out, and they got called for on Brock Cunningham. It was supposed to be an over-the-back call, and it wasn't. So – you know, you don't want those things to haunt you, but those are realistic things that teams deal with, and we'll see if the horns, if that affects them moving forward. I hope that's just a Big 12 ref thing, but I've seen a lot of Longhorn fans say that, all right, now that we're done with the Big 12, we don't have to worry about Big 12 refs anymore, and uh, things are going to be okay. Look at Texas's last two NCAA tournament losses, right? Purdue shot 120 free throws yep. against Texas two years ago, and Miami shot 200 free throws against <laughs> Texas last year, so... And sometimes just officials are officials. That's how it works. It's not just the Big 12 screwing Texas thing. Uh, if you get a bad set of refs, and you're right, if there's a reputation that your team's a little dirty, and Texas has had foul issues all season long, not just you know Brock Cunningham, but this is a team that has struggled to defend without fouling, that stuff could follow you. It shouldn't. I think it's ridiculous. I think you should call a game unbiased if you're an official. But you're right. That might be something that uh, Texas has to worry about. All right. Uh, the bracket reveal continues here on CBS. Purdue the number one seed in the Midwest region. They're your number three 
overall seed in the dance. I think there's a chance we uh, see Texas on the screen in the not too distant future. How about this though for Purdue? They get to play their first and second round games in Indianapolis. Oh wow, that's, that's, that's a bus trip to the game, man. That might be ridiculous. walking there. <laughs> yeah, and West Lafayette. Yeah, man, that's very close and. Yeah, Purdue, they're going to be tough. I mean, Matt Painter, a lot like Rick Barnes, has really struggled in the tournament, especially when his teams have Final Four aspirations. And is this per, per, excuse me, Purdue team different, led by Zach Eady? We know how good he is, but is Braden Smith, he's going to be healthy enough to make a big run? We'll see. Absolutely. All right, Utah State is the eight seed in this region, and it's TCU as the nine seed. So if Texas is going to be an eight or a nine, uh, they will be in the West region, potentially having to play North Carolina. I like that. Which, hey, UNC is the fourth number one seed. And, and, and I think like the top three number one seeds, I think there's a gap between UConn, Houston, Purdue, and everybody else in college basketball. And I'm not sitting here guaranteeing you that one of those three teams is going to win it all. But it feels like those three teams have been one seeds pretty much for the entire season. I'm trying to figure out who the fourth number one is. I think if you're a Texas fan, not sitting here telling you UNC some sort of scrub – and we'll wait and see if this is actually the case. But that's what you want, right? If you're an 8-9, yeah. you want to be going up against the weakest number one in round two. That might be where the Longhorns are headed here, Zay. Yeah, you think about North Carolina, Herbert Davis team. <laughs> they have one of the best starting fives in the nation. Yeah. They don't have a deep bench. No, they don't. And you got to like that for Texas advantage, especially if they were to get in foul trouble. And you think about Dylan DeSue going up against an Armando Baycock. Like, that's a mismatch. On the Sioux side, like this, uh, to Sioux be able to take Baycock outside, and make so. a move and work, and things that he doesn't normally do. And if you can slow down RJ Davis, who averages around 21 points a game, which I'll be the assignment of Kendall Weaver or Tyrese Hunter, I like those matchups for Texas. Yeah, and we saw Burns from NC State just eat Baycott's oh, lunch yesterday. Dominated. I know those are different players, but uh, yeah, that could be a, a beneficial matchup for Texas. You got Kansas as a four seed. It is so weird to see them that low. Sanford ain't no joke either. Yep. Sam, Sanford and the SoCon uh, conference, they are not no joke. That could easily be an upset at that 413 spot. Fred, Sanford, and Son. I think that's <laughs> it right there. Yeah, I think a lot of people are going to have Kansas bowing out early in the dance. We'll see uh, what the Jayhawks can do. Of course, they won it all two years ago. So we got to megaphone over there our guy intern brock holding a megaphone that's a scary thought for everybody else who's who's here in the okay. place yeah, yeah good thank move, you take it for him yeah. good, good move right there john as we go through the midwest region so there's a chance texas is a seven seed i guess there's a chance texas is a 10 seed we're about to find out uh who those two teams are in this midwest region uh, to try to figure out exactly what this thing will look like creating the number three seed what do you think about creating this year I still think they're solid. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're solid. When you think about McDermott and the teams that he usually has, you know, they fit that mold. And even though they don't have Nimhard like they did last year, they still got a lot of guys that can fill it up. And yeah. Oh, Ooh, seven. A seed. little bit of a surprise. So oh, do we need to stand up and clap? Oh, yeah. Like, like, oh, yeah, yeah. Like we're in the locker room, yeah. like we're at the team watch party. The Texas Longhorns, the seventh seed in the Midwest region. And who are they going to play? Well, we don't know. Because they're going to play the winner of Virginia. Oh, shit. All right. We got, we got sirens on that megaphone. I wasn't ready for that right there. Someone's coming to get Brock. Texas will play the winner of Virginia and Colorado State in the round of 64. So good news, bad news here, Zay, as our guy KD is pulling up right now. Good news, bad news. Uh, the good news is the team that Texas will play will already have a game under their belt, right? They're going to be tired because two days before they're going to be playing in the first four in Dayton. So Texas is getting that extra rest in between the conference tournament and the start of the NCAA tournament. And the team that they go up against will obviously not be nearly as fresh. The bad news is, say, I think in every tournament except for one, a first four team has won a game in the round of 64. Mm. So obviously you've got – Four first four games, two of them involve 16 seeds. You usually don't look at those. So it could be the other first four game or the winner of that one goes on to win an actual game in the actual tournament. But uh, that's been bad news. Teams who play in Dayton, more often than not, at least one of them finds a way to win a game in the actual dance. So maybe not great that the Longhorns will be going up against a team like that. 
Yeah, and obviously the committee, they like to do these funny things that make sense. They got Tennessee at that number two spot. So How about that? The horns and the balls and pants, it will be a Rick Barnes showing, which, again, knowing Rick Barnes is history. What do you mean? I like it. What do you mean it'll be a Rick Barnes showing? It'll be a St. Peter's showing. Oh, come St. On. Peter's going to pull off another upset. Not the Peacock As a 15 seed against a two seed from the SEC. You know, they got Kentucky a couple of years ago. <laughs> now we'll get Kentucky's big rival in Tennessee. So we're going to get a Texas St. Peter's matchup in oh, round two. Just man. brace yourself for that. Come on, Rick. I'm Rick, letting you know. At least win one, Rick. Oh, at least win one. You're right, though. Yeah, I mean, we touched on storylines earlier. The committee likes to do stuff like this. And, Look, Texas will be favored against either Virginia or Colorado State. Uh, you know, they get Tennessee in round two. That's a fun one with uh, what Rick Barnes did. He's the best coach in the history of Texas basketball. That's uh, That'd be a fun one. But also, if you're a Longhorn fan, we know postseason Rick. We know they call him regular season Rick for a reason. Uh, Tennessee's tough. They're really good. They were in the running for a one seed before they lost in the SEC tournament earlier this week. I don't think they're an unbeatable team by any stretch. That's a game I think Texas could win on a Saturday or Sunday. Yeah, obviously you've got to slow down, don't connect, and you think about the matchups there. Do you put somebody bigger on him like a Dylan Mitchell? Even though Dylan Mitchell is not my favorite defender at times, he's capable if he's really locked in and sticking to the game plan. Or do you put somebody smaller on him like a 6'2 Weaver? I mean, Weaver would be giving up about four inches in size, but – Donk neck, you need different guys to help slow him down. And what makes Tennessee go are guys like Zakai Ziegler and Jordan James. So, yeah, you know, you got to get past that first round. Either Virginia or Colorado State will definitely be locked in for those Dayton matchups come Tuesday. But, man, Texas, I think they're in a good spot. Like, you have to look at their bracket and you look at the side that they're in. Like, I think they're in a really good spot being on the same side as teams like Purdue and – yeah, the Horns, they're in a place to where maybe they can make a run. Yeah, people were saying I was a little too optimistic, saying Texas was going to be an eight seed. Apparently, I was too pessimistic, right? The Longhorns getting some love from the tournament committee despite not a great non-conference schedule. And they played two really good non-conference teams. They lost to both of them, but the Longhorns going 9-9 uh, and nine in the toughest league in the sport. Even though they lost that first-round game of the conference tournament, they still got a little bit of a Big 12 budge, I think, from the committee this year. Yeah, they definitely did. You know – Winning on the road like they did. Yes, they lost to UCF at home, and they had a couple of other losses, but a lot of those were against quad one teams. I mean, you lose at home to Tech, you lose at home to Iowa State, but you beat Tech on the road, you know what I'm saying? Like, you go on the road, you beat other high-quality teams. And think about this Texas last-second shots that they hit this year. Like, Louisville was trapped. If you lose that game, where do you end up? You know, you beat Cincinnati on the last second shot. Tyrese Hunter needed the last second shot to beat Baylor. So it's been very close, a little too close for comfort, if you ask me, when it comes to where the Texas Longhorns have seeded out yeah. and where they move forward from here based on what their uh, schedule and record was. But, hey, they're in. They're in a good spot. I like the Tennessee matchup if they advance. I like the Purdue matchup if they advance that far. Rodney Terry, he should be really excited about the Horns postseason play. Let me ask you this. You got a preference. I mean, I, look, the bracket just came out. I don't know how much Virginia you've watched this year. I don't know how much Colorado State you've watched this year. But just looking at uh, that matchup in Dayton coming up this week, you got a preference on opponent for Texas. You talk about Virginia. Tony Bennett's a national championship winning coach. Now, Virginia ain't been the same since they won it all in 2019. But that team still plays elite defense. They're a top 10 defense in the country, according to Ken Palm. Texas has struggled. You think of Houston, you think of K-State, you think of Kansas. Those are some of the other really, really elite defenses that the Longhorns have played against this year. And they tended to struggle against teams that were locked down defensively. So that scares you a little bit. Uh, but then again, I brought this up earlier. Like a team like Colorado State, not that battle-tested coming out of the Mountain West. Uh, they've played a much easier schedule than a team like Virginia has played. And obviously a team like Texas has played. Early thoughts on the, who you'd rather see on either Thursday or Friday? Oh, Colorado State, 100%. No question. Colorado State, 100%. You do not want to go up against a national championship coach just from that standpoint. Yeah. Like, he, 
loves this time of the year. He's proven that. Yes, he's had way better talent than he does now, but when you have a national championship coach that has been there and done that, and it's very familiar to him on just how day-to-day operations work and how the scout guys and get prepared and you know just do you know, certain things to get prepared for a game during this time of the year. Tony Bennett has done that at the highest level possible. So you want to get away from that and hopefully get a coach that hasn't been here before in Colorado State and a team that hasn't played the caliber schools that the Horns have played and see what happens there. But, yeah, that's going to be a good matchup in Dayton. And, yeah, I don't really know who has the upper hand, but I would definitely say Tony Bennett at Virginia coming from the ACC. I will say this, Colorado State number 38 in Ken Palm this year, Virginia all the way down at number 69. Very nice in the Ken Palm rankings this year. So if you look at that, maybe Virginia would be the easier matchup, but coaching matters so much in the month of March. Uh, Nico Medved doesn't have the resume that Tony Bennett does. Now, only one of those coaches has been interviewed by BK, and that's Nico Medved. Oh, really? So I don't know if that helps or hurts him. Uh, good dude, for the record. That's my worst flex of all time. And I've interviewed the Colorado State basketball coach. Where'd you see him at? It was at the Final Four. Trey and I interviewed him uh, when it was in San Antonio a couple okay. of years ago. He was just one of those coaches rolling around at the Final Four. Yeah. Obviously, his team was not there. But uh, a good dude, Nico Medved. But yeah, like – I don't know. I, I'm not going to be scared if, if Virginia is the matchup. I will say this. You're right. There's an obvious coaching advantage that goes to UVA, but to me there's an obvious player advantage that goes to Texas. And uh, yeah, watching Virginia try to offense, it, I mean, it's disrespectful to the paint if you're saying it's like watching paint dry. Like It is a chore to watch that team try to do anything offensively. And when they won it all in 2019, they had pro-caliber players, right? They had Kyle Guy. They had Ty Jerome. They had, dude, they had DeAndre, DeAndre Hunter, Hunter on that team. Yeah. Like they, they had guys who – Playing on oh, that expression doesn't work in basketball, but uh, they had all playing sorts, back to backs. There you go, all <laughs> sorts of NBA talent on that roster. This ain't the same Virginia team. So from a player standpoint, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not too worried if uh, if that's the team Texas has to play in the round of 64. Yeah, and you know your stat scares me a little bit about the first four team always making it to the round of 32, at least one of them. But you do like that they're not going to be fresh. I mean, again, when you're 22, 21 years old, and you're playing off of momentum and just straight up energy from being in the tournament. You're not necessarily worried about fatigue, but and that's still going to be a thing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? When you're shooting shots short and, and Texas is putting the defense, the caliber defense that we know they can put on you against a Virginia or against a Colorado State, and that could wear those teams down in that first game. So the Horns. They better be locked in on Tuesday on the scouting report because that's also a disadvantage. Like, you can't just scout now. Yep. I mean, you are, but you're scouting two teams. You know, you don't have the luxury of just sticking to one and focusing on one. You've got to scout two, watch the game on Tuesday, and then prepare that night after the game and on Wednesday and wherever you play. I don't know if it's a Thursday or Friday game. It doesn't matter. Either way, the preparation is going to be different for some of these other teams that know their matchups. Well, I'll tell you what, man. I keep bringing up Ken Palm, and I keep bringing up the defensive efficiency stat because I I think Texas' worst three-game stretch of the year was that Houston-K-State-Kansas stretch. They did beat K-State. That was the regular season game in Austin. I was like 62-56. It was ugly. The Longhorns struggled to score the basketball. And obviously, they just lost to K-State last week. Those are three, maybe the three best teams defensively in the Big 12. And Texas played like dog crap against all three of them. Virginia, number seven in Ken Palm defensive efficiency. Tennessee, number three in Ken Palm defensive efficiency. So if you get through both of those games, I mean, you're going to be beaten and bruised to get through weekend one to make it to the Sweet 16 because those are two elite defenses that you might have to go up against. And for a team that has gone through long stretches where they struggle to score the basketball, especially if Ace Miss or the Sioux is off, uh, those are potential nightmare situations for this Texas team. Yeah, and that's why those other guys that you didn't name, they have to be huge, starting with Tyrese Hunter. Mm-hmm. If Tyrese Hunter is knocking down that three-point shot, that changes everything for the Lawrence. You can't help on Dylan DeSue like you could before. You can't help their blitz Max Aceness coming off screens and different opportunities that he could possibly have because you're worried about Tyrese Hunter knocking down shots. You're worried about Brock Cunningham. When Brock Cunningham hits a three, oh, Texas is a completely different ball club. Yeah. If you're going to give Brock Cunningham that shot, you have to. You have to live with something. You have to pick your poison somehow. And when Brock Cunningham's knocking down that three, now you have to worry about closing out. 
that changes everything for the horn. So those other guys, they're going to be huge this time of the year like they should be. And playing against those really good defensive teams that you just mentioned, you need terrific offensive players. The great Kevin Dunn has joined us here. Yeah. Crown hey, of what's up, baby? You got two of those things right. Um, Kevin and Dunn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is a spot, man. Yeah. This is a spot. You've been coming here for how long? Probably um, – since the early 80s came last night to meet jeff bryant a good buddy of mine and we were talking in, in you know good cheeseburger and all that so I was coming back from taylor and obviously wanted to come see you guys so it, good thing that like we have a pretty good crowd here dude you know? oh yeah you're famous in this place it's like cheers I mean, everyone knows your name yeah. you've been giving out hugs left and right i don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing <laughs> no. I, it's funny like i i don't come as much as i should i get cheeseburgers all the time but they have fat tire they have good beer selection you didn't so. go with the green beer today st patty's day what are you doing dude it tastes better i know huh. um i'm a bad mick Oh, you are. <laughs> At the end of the day. These are your people. What are you doing here? I know, I know. Not wearing any green. I didn't actually know it was today. Last night I was talking with uh, Big John, who runs it, and, and was oh, like, man. when's St. Patrick's Day? He's like, come on. You're, you're Kevin Kelly yeah. Dunn. I'm like, eh, sorry. Uh, apparently not. Uh, Oklahoma not in the tournament. Whoa. Uh, yeah. I, I told you. I So I, sad. I said. No, you called that. When. I said when the Horns, Dylan DeSue went out against that Baylor game, if the Horns would have lost out, they would be in the same spot Oklahoma would be in because yeah. they lost their best player, JV on McCollum. And look at that net ranking. Like, <laughs> you know, that's pretty high for a team that's not out. Not, or that is right, out. Not me. in, right? Yeah. yeah. So I, it's just JV on McCollum being out. Porter Mosier's team looked really bad these last few games. And – Hey, they're going to be at home, maybe playing in the NIT. That game turned out to be huge, right? The regular season finale between Texas and Oklahoma. I think Texas is probably in regardless, but uh, that win for the Longhorns, probably the one that kept Oklahoma out of the dance. So, uh, yeah, love to see that Texas in, Oklahoma out. KD, your thoughts on the Texas's draw? They get the winner of Virginia and Colorado State and then a potential matchup with Rick Barnes in round two. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you love because we talked on Thursday. You were like, they're going to probably be a seven or eight. Um, I did feel like the way they match everything up, that we were somehow going to have Rick, who I love. I mean, I love Rick Barnes, you know. Um, But I felt like there was going to be some matchup there, whether it was one, eight, nine, or two, seven like this. And obviously the way they played in the SEC tournament, it didn't shock me they were a two seed. But – yeah, I, this team could get to the Sweet 16. I could. Yeah. And you're going we, up against regular season Rick. We know Rick. Yeah. And we know what they've done. And I don't know if you guys watched their exit in the SEC. Yeah, Mississippi State. And Dal- Dalton ass. sitting his ass on the bench. Felt like me on the bench. I was like, I've been there, <laughs> man. But you can score. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And, it, like, he kind of threw the white towel in there early. Um, yeah. They could they could make a run. Um, who knows? They could also be blown out by thirty points. And BK, yeah. you know, I've heard both y'all. I mean, you two on Texas Sports and Filter know more college basketball and basketball in general than anyone. No offense to me and everyone else on that channel, but y'all know a ton. And y'all been like, they could go to the Sweet Sixteen, maybe Elite Eight, and they could be blown out in the first round. Yeah, and that's kind of where we're at. You I, know? I brought up the stat earlier. They've had the first four format in the last 12 tournaments in 11 of the 12 years that that format has existed at least one team that was in the first four went on to win a game in the round of 64 yeah so that that could be scary for texas but man i mean i don't even know like i might pick st peter's to beat tennessee that's how little faith i have in rick barnes <laughs> in the ncaa tournament so you're talking about that as a potential second round matchup that's not bad at all. So, yeah, I mean, Texas could easily lose to either of the teams playing in Dayton. But if they did make it to weekend two, I don't think it'd be the most shocking thing in the world. Well, you no. think about Rodney Terry and Rick Barnes's relationship. Yeah. RT being an assistant for Rick Barnes during that. They pick the world of each other. They do. They do. If I'm RT, I'm like, I know this guy. I know what he loves to do. I know how he acts during this time of the year. Right. That's an advantage. Yeah. Now, Agreed. Rick can't necessarily say that about RT because RT wasn't calling the shots. Rick Barnes was. Right. So now seeing him as a head coach, 
it's a little different. Yes, he knows him, but it's a little bit different. And I think that gives our team a little bit of advantage just knowing how Rick Barnes' philosophy is going to this time of the year if they match up. Yeah, I'm with you. That's a good point. All right, looking at the entirety of the bracket, guys, I'm not asking you to fill the whole thing out right now, but – uh, early thoughts, overall thoughts. You got a favorite to win the national championship. Just seeing yeah, this whole thing you. unveiled. Obviously, right. UConn, Houston, Purdue, and North Carolina, your four number one seeds. UConn, the defending champs. Houston right now, the Vegas favorite to win the whole thing. You guys have an early lean on who will be cutting down the nets in Glendale here in a couple of weeks? Um, I mean – Gosh, it's so tough. It's always tough during this time of the year. I thought Purdue got a really good draw. I mean, you think about Texas being there and you look at Kansas. Kansas doesn't scare you at all this season. I mean, Bill Self's team is completely imploded these last few weeks, and they still are dealing with the health of Dickerson and the health of McCullers. So if you're Purdue, you're not scared of that one bit. Gonzaga, yes, Mark Few was there. We know the Gonzaga name during this time of year. They always go far, but that's not the same Gonzaga team that had guys like Drew Timmy or you know guys like Jalen Suggs. So Purdue, they're sitting in a really good spot. Like, you're not necessarily scared of an Oregon. Like, Man. again, Tennessee, we're talking about Are you them. scared of Kansas? First round. No, that's what I'm saying. You're not right. scared of Kansas. I mean. Like, Kansas, their big five is good, but their bench is so suspect. So and their big five, certain five, a lot of those guys are hurt, like I just mentioned. So, yeah, Go if you're that trainer. Because that, that region looks it's easy weak. as hell. I've said for Texas's sake, that looks good. Well, how about no, that? You, you got Matt Painter and Rick Barnes, two notorious March chokers in the same region. Oh, that, hey, it's doable. Yeah. That is the weakest division. You're right. I mean, I haven't the, seen the other ones, but that has to be the weakest. Oh, yeah. 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 You got Creighton as the three seed. That's a team that's underachieved in the month of March a lot. Yeah, absolutely. The Creighton Plantations, as we like to call them, a few years ago. <laughs> oh, no, that was their coach, McDermott. He said something about that. Right. Yeah. Too soon. That's not me. too soon. It's five years ago. Yo, they gave him an extension, man. Yeah, they I did. They liked what he I said. I don't mean him. I mean the plantation thinks oh. too soon. Oh yeah, by him. Like yeah. Two hundred years too soon. That's right. a bad bit right there. And Omaha, Nebraska, they probably loved it though. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like I, I'm not sitting here telling you, you should pick Texas to make the Final Four, but you, you do look at these four regions, and it does feel like that uh, this Midwest region that Texas is a part of might be the easiest. Of the four, dude, they can win this. <laughs> y'all, y'all watch a lot more college. I, I watch a lot of college or more college basketball than some people, but yeah, yeah they could. I mean, is there anyone there that really scares you? Just Purdue, if you're Texas, yeah. I mean, yeah. that's Edie, not that's... Edie would be a, a bitch. We saw that two uh, years yeah. ago, obviously, um, different teams, but Texas had no answers for but that. But also, guy. how healthy is Dylan? And I heard you talk about coming back from Taylor, uh, Shedrick. Like, where is he? You know, he's right. not been what we what we hoped he'd be, or I think what Rodney thought he would be. But he can give you some size. He's, you know. Yeah, you got a double team, Zach Eady. Just letting them catch and throw up that weak jump hook. Yeah, he's right there. He's seven four. All you gotta do is throw that arm yeah. at. You're not contesting it. So you got to give them those double teams. And what separates Purdue, other than those teams that Matt Painter's had in the past, they're second and three point shooting in the nation. Right. So you. Yeah. Doubling them, it's risky, but I take that risk. So, like, like you guards, y'all up, beat me. You know? Yeah, hey, y'all yeah. beat me. If your guards are good enough to knock down shots when all the pressure's on them, like Purdue knows they have a weak side. They know that they're picked to go to the Final Four. They know that this is Zach Eadie's last year, and this is time for Matt Painter to get over the hump. That's a lot of pressure on those guys. Yeah. So, Braden Smith, who hurt his leg a couple of games ago, is he going to be 100%? Because he's their second best player. He's terrific. Zach Eady gets all the love, which he deserves, best player in the nation. But Braden Smith, their point guard, number three, averaging 12 points, seven assists, five rebounds. Like, that's a triple threat type, or triple double type guy any type of night. If he's not playing well or if he's a little gimpy due to that injury he suffered in the Big Ten tournament, they could be a quick out also. Yeah. And Zach Eady's my least favorite player to watch in college basketball. Now he looks like the what was the guy Robert, the tallest guy in the world, like in the 50s, was eight seven. Yeah. And just had giantism. Did yeah. He reminds me of that. Did he play <laughs> basketball somewhere? Uh, no, no, no. That's he, disappointing. He died at 30, so too uh, soon. He's gonna play college yeah. basketball. <laughs> too soon. He died in the 50s. Like, I gotta wait. How long do I have to wait? God. Yeah, he he's 
I know he gets those Yao Ming comparisons. He doesn't have the touch from the outside like Yao did. No. But when it comes to back to the basket like game. Like Kinnan, though, he's got, he, like, he's a he's lot got like, a little yeah. jump hook. Yeah. He's, he's got some touch there. He does. He does. But, you know, if let's say Texas had that matchup. Him trying to guard Dylan Basu on the perimeter, take him out. Oh, and then, yeah, that's yeah. lunch me. Holy, that shit. is lunch me. This guy's huge. That's a guy. That's a guy. <laughs> Eight foot eleven. Eight foot eleven. Why did this guy not play college ball? He looks like a jabroni. There's no chance this guy's was coordinated. Total jabroni. But eight eleven. I know. Who scored over that? Guy? That that's who Zach Eady reminds me. Did of. goaltending exist back in the day? Just put that guy in front of the hoop and let him catch the ball. Dude, he was born before Nisa. I, I, I'm oh, not sure yeah. this even. That, yeah, he's born before Dean Smith. Yeah, that's not happening. What year, Although uh, Dean Smith did pay him money to come to Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That is hilarious. I want to ask you all, though, because, I mean, you all are two of my best friends who really know college basketball. With UConn and Houston, especially the way Houston played against Iowa State, Iowa State's hot right now. Are they like what favorite are they for y'all? Like, is Houston still the favorite? PK, yeah. I'll start with you. You know, I, I picked Houston to win it all the last two years, and they let me down the last two years. So I, I think I am going to ultimately have them winning it all again this season, and hope right. that the third time is the charm. But uh, I, I think they've got everything it takes Can to win. Houston's region. And, and another step. Look, I think UConn has the toughest region. Number one. KD, you and I talked about it on Wednesday or Thursday. Like, nobody repeats. It's so hard to do. We've seen it happen twice in the last 50 years where a team goes back to back. So I'm hesitant to pick UConn, even though they're the number one overall seed for that reason. And Purdue, just their their notorious postseason choker. So of those three teams, and I think those three teams have kind of been in the league of their own all season long. I feel best about Houston ultimately cutting down the nets, but Obviously, they've uh, you know, they've been favored to win it before. Last year, you go back to the 80s, the five slam jamma teams, and somehow, some way, they've come up short. They obviously have to get over that hump. But if you ask me who I feel is the most complete team, who I feel has the recipe to win this whole thing, I'd go with Houston. So, Zay, we've had two teams in all of our lifetimes, you guys are younger than me, who have repeated in college basketball. Should have been UNLV. Sorry. Yeah. It ended up being Duke, so it would have been taken away. And Florida. Can UConn do that? I think they can. I think they can. They have everything you want in the national championship caliber team. Starts with their great guard play, Tristan Newton and Cam Spencer. I watch him, man. Those guys can play. Yo, those guys are good. Tristan Newton's from El Paso. He was a no star kid. Like you could go in on Rodney Terry or Chris Beard, whoever the hell was here when he was coming out of high school, and say, "Oh, how'd you let that kid get out of Texas?" Right. He was a no star kid. So development, he it got wasn't better. Carson Edwards or even Jimmy. Right. You know, you know it wasn't yeah. one of those guys. So he just got better. You know, grew got in the weight room and just worked on his craft and now he's one of the top guards in the nation and they got Donovan Klingon and you think about that matchup if they were to play Purdue in the final four national championship game Klingon's like 7-3 he can move he's been dealing with injuries all year long and now that he's healthy it makes UConn that much scarier so Dan Hurley's squad they're terrifying man and it kind of just goes to how well he's done as a coaching job Dude, you lost Jordan Hawkins to the NBA, Andre Johnson Jackson to the NBA. You're losing the dominant Sunogo, three high-end guys in your national championship squad, and you're yeah. the number one overall seed. Now, their side, East Region, is brutal. Brutal. It's It might be the toughest. We talk about Texas and the Midwest being the easiest. Theirs is brutal. They got Illinois at three. Illinois just won the Big yeah. Ten championship and beat uh, Wisconsin while doing it. Iowa State, Iowa number State's two. red hot. Yeah, right BK, and I agree, thinks that Auburn could make a Final Four with Bruce Pearl's team that just won the yeah. SEC championship. Like, don't sleep on them at all. So UConn didn't get any favors with the committee. And in BYU, Mormon shooting threes. Those Watch out. Mormons yeah. could hoop. Those way, Mormons could hoop. Way too many white guys yeah. for me to feel good in the tournament. I'll tell you what, I don't want to run but into a team They like, like that. to fill it up um, on and off the court. Yes. A lot of soaking going on. Hey man, they got God on their side, you know. Well, oh, we got we, we got, all have God. Yeah, what do you got? I got I got Jewish God. You guys don't have yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. They got Mormon God. I don't have him. I do claim him though. Jewish God or Mormon yeah. God? Both. Uh, I claim all. Of them. All right, that's that's fine. I guess we're looking for bodies. We need recruits, so we'll, we'll take what we can get right there. Yeah, that's loaded. I, I'll tell you what, I'm picking Auburn. That is, that, I'm picking Auburn to win that region. Ooh, I, I think all, like Auburn is a problem right that's now. That's a ballsy call, yeah. but I. You know, you guys, once again, watch more, but I watched them uh, today and watched them in the SEC tournament. 
They're pretty good. It's not because their coach is Jewish either. I promise that has nothing to do with it. All right. I just I think they're oh, really Brucey. good. Yeah. I think they're a legit national. Well, let's be honest. Contender. Bruce deep down is an atheist because <laughs> yeah, kind of what he's done at Tennessee and everywhere else. That is, that is true. Yeah, I don't. Uh, he doesn't do a lot of praying. That's for sure. He does a lot of illegal. Hey, stuff. I saw him crying at the end of that game. Bruce has a heart. He's changed. Oh, that's all it takes. Yeah, yeah. He, he's changed. He has a heart. He's a good guy. Okay, dude. I got some real estate for you in Montana. <laughs> Check it out. Yeah. <laughs> Oceanfront property too, huh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Zay, Zay's too good of a person. Much better than us. That didn't say a lot, but all right. So let me ask you guys this while we're talking about uh, some of these contending teams. You look at the one seeds. Which which one seed do you think goes out earliest in the tournament? I mean, it feels like every year at least one one seed loses before the sweet sixteen. And it's crazy to think about, but it happens more often than not. Of the four number one seeds, UConn, Houston, Purdue, and North Carolina, who do y'all think uh, is the first team to get bounced? That I'll take Carolina. I think Carolina too. That Tom Izzo is a dirty son of a bee during this time of the year. She's and Megan's Michigan State, so watch out. Michigan right. State. No, I'm saying that in the most positive <laughs> yeah, way. Right. Tom yeah, Izzo is yeah. a dirt. I would not want to play Tom Izzo during this time of the year. Yeah. He is just. It's Izzo time. That dude loves this time of the year. Yeah. Okay. Megan says Purdue's getting bounced first, and she's green hair, so I'm listening to her. <laughs> I mean, hey, Matt Painter, you know that look and what he does during this time of the year. But if I had to say, I think it would be Carolina. Their starting five is terrific, but yeah. once somebody gets in the foul trouble and Hubert Davis is going down that bench, it could be a struggle fest, and that's the last thing yeah. those Tar Heels want. It absolutely could be. Yeah, I mean, I know Carolina. that's low-hanging fruit because they're the fourth number one seed. But, man, Mississippi State's playing some good ball, too. What they did to Tennessee at the yeah. start of the week was really impressive. And, yeah, Michigan State in the month of March. I don't care what seed that they are. It just finds a way to get it done more often than not at this time of the year. So that could be a, a scary matchup no, there. Don't don't sleep on Scott Drew's team, the Bears, going to the Final Four in yeah. that major. And like, I think it's the second weakest side because Arizona, yeah, they're good, but during this time of the year, they could always slip up. And Scott Drew, a national championship coach, like, yeah. he gets his guys going but, this time of the year. I would not be surprised if Baylor finessed their way to the Final Four. No, I wouldn't either, Megan. Yeah. Um, but but also if you if you think about, you know, there have been at least a couple or a month ago, there were more top ten teams at home that have been upset by unranked teams in the history of college basketball. I think a lot of it is the parody we see. So the UNLVs or the Dukes or the upsets we saw back in the day aren't as shocking anymore. And this could be a year, I mean, I've you know, we've seen it where We've got a 14 seed, a nine seed, a yeah. well, look at three last seed, year. a six seed, right? Well, like, you know? Look, you want madness. You want chaos. That's the beauty of this tournament. But for me, like, I want the madness early. But yeah. at the end of the tournament, I want, like, four really good teams in the yep. final four. We didn't get that last year. We had a four seed, two fives, and a nine. Yeah. It's one of the most boring final fours we've ever had. And UConn, you know, beat the shit out of both of the teams that they played. Right. Like, you ultimately want the cream to rise to the top. But in this day in college basketball, with how much parity we have with the transfer portal, with the COVID year and guys playing till they're 35 years old. How are you I mean, guys talking about bit, that? It's a little bit different. Now. Who's the guy who's 27? You know, Howard has a dude in his eighth year. Yeah, Brock Cunningham. Yeah. Also. <laughs> Brock Cunningham and I started college together, and I graduated in 2016. All right, like that is bullshit. I'm Dude, so jealous Brock of guys like that. A year before me at Westland. So, <laughs> when was, was that? He was 96. Okay, so was 97. class of 96. Yeah, of course, of course he was. Oh my God. Yeah, that's that's the thing. As we as we bring things back, uh, bring things back to Texas here towards the end of the show. You know, I'm looking at Ken Palm right now, guys. Texas is the fourth most experienced team in all of college basketball this year. Now, it hasn't always translated into consistent play during the year to this point, but experience matters in March. You look at teams that do make deep runs, and usually experience is a big part of that. Most of the recent national championships have been loaded with upperclassmen. I know, Zay, everybody focuses on the McDonald's All-Americans, the one and dones, the, guy who go high, the guys who go high in the NBA draft, but, man, experience matters at this time of year. Texas has guys who have been in college for a long time, but they also have guys 
who've won in this tournament before, there's a chance that that recipe could be something that leads this team to a second weekend. For sure. And if you're Ronnie Terry, you got to rely on that. you got to rely on Max Aceman's experience getting Earl Roberts to the Sweet 16. you got to rely on Dylan DeSue dominating the Big 12 tournament last year and also dominating March until he got hurt this past season too. So, yeah, hopefully that experience will come to play. But at the end of the day, once that ball gets tipped up, man, all those nerves go out the way, and it's just hoop by then. You know what I'm saying? The team that plays better, the team that plays harder, more ferocious on defense, that sticks to the game plan better, that's coached the best, usually wins. And sometimes you saw with John Calipari with some of those teams that went to the Final Four early in his run at Kentucky that were freshmen. Sometimes experience don't matter. If you yeah. got guys that buy in, that are yep. hot at the right time, and that are talented enough, you can see those upsets, which is why you cannot count out Kentucky, even though they're really young. But, yeah, now with just what the transfer portal is, that COVID extra year, the parity that we see in college basketball, we're seeing that less and less. And those teams that have the most experience, like the San Diego State team of last year, yep. that got to a national championship, usually thrive. So we've seen so much stuff change. Certainly, I'm older than you guys in my lifetime in college basketball in the tournament, but some things remain the same. And BK, you and I were talking about it, I think, on the air and off the air. Still comes down to guard play, right? Hell yeah. Yep. All right. This time yeah. of the year, that, that's where Purdue has struggled, right? It feels like they always have a seven-foot big guy who can ball, but they have not had good enough guards to make deep runs. And, you know, Texas – They've got one guard we feel good about. Like, even though Max Aismas was in a little bit of a rut yeah. shooting-wise, like, I think what he did against K-State. Dude, if Tyrese is feeling it, that's we're, it. we're like, good, man. You know, Max yeah. Aismas and Tyrese Hunter, that could be like a top 10 to 15 backcourt in the country. It's part of the reason why Texas was a top 20 team going into the year. Problem is, I mean, the last two games have been just a microcosm of Tyrese Hunter's Texas career. He goes for 30 against Oklahoma in the regular season finale, and then he goes for three in the Big 12 tournament opener against Kansas State. So you don't need 30 from Tyrese Hunter, but if you can get, you know, 20 from Aceness and 15 from Tyrese Hunter, that's how you make a deep tournament run right there. Yeah, even Tyrese Hunter dribble penetrating and getting assists. I mean, that Oklahoma yeah. game, he had 30, but yep. he also had seven assists yeah. to go along with it. Which may have been, in a weird way, more important. <laughs> True, yeah. Because yeah. I think it led to the 30 the way he was dishing. For sure, because – when he's getting those assists, they're going to guys like Dylan Mitchell, who damn sure right. need that confidence yep. to see that ball go through the hoop to for him to play flush. well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, Tyrese Hunter, his assist and his play at all, you know, that affects everybody on the team. And if he could get going, look out. Did you just order that, KD? No, that's Big John and um, – you I've have to ice that thing. You just you? got iced. They got, got iced. I've don't got you? a seven thirty meeting tomorrow, so I appreciate it, John. Big John, you just iced <laughs> Kevin Dunn. <laughs> that is, what is this? Smirnoff? You've never. You were born. They gotta chug that you thing. To you gotta get it. on the knee and I'm chug not it. chugging anything. What do you mean? That's the uh, rule. That's, that's the icing. You just took a sip of Smirnoff ice. That's oh. pretty good. It should be jail. Oh, it's not bad. Pretty good. It's a Zima. Is that a nickname? Or is that actually what it is? How dare you? And. I've had a Zima before, all right? Yeah, um, this drink. I'm make fun hey, of hey, <laughs> come on. Brock, you're 22, on, man. You're oh playing pool and you're hitting on chicks. Like, <laughs> I, I remember that in 98 here, all right? You, you do that at 42. 45. Okay. Well, and no, I don't. You don't huh? Okay, you're missing yeah, out. I don't know, man. You're missing um, out. I want to ask you all, though, with Texas, like, I really want to get into what, because this team's been so up and down and, and bipolar to a certain degree. We obviously know if, if if Tyrese is playing the way, he, and it seems like defensively when he's playing really well, that spurs oh, the offense. That's and what they, I was you know, yes. we know that, you know. Yes. But defensively, where are y'all with this team? Like, I mean, do, do you expect them to show up? It, it seems like at times they'll lock down, and at times they are Tom Pender's Ole. Hopefully, <laughs> whichever set of refs they get, let them play for both halves. Too. For both halves, like let them play. Yeah. You know, don't call all that ticky-tack stuff. Like, it's March right. Madness. In the Big 12, you know, there's that conspiracy theory of, oh, we hate Texas going to the SEC and Brett Yarmark, yada, yada, yada. But if they get a good set of refs that just want those guys to you duke mean it out. You Miami last year? Yeah, not yeah. Miami last year. Just let them duke it out. Don't get involved. Like, let the best team win. 
I think Texas will be fine. But once they start getting those ticky tack fouls, which we know you're going to go at Max A. Smith, that's what everybody does. Yeah. Like he's small, he's about five foot 10, 160 something pounds. If that, you go at Max A. Smith right. also because you want him to make, you want to make him tired right. so he doesn't give you work offensively. But they're small when it comes to those guards. Hunter, A. Smith, Weaver, they're going to get attacked. Is the help defense good enough and the rotation good enough? to negate all of that, I think it is. But if they have a crew that calls ticky-tack stuff, and you're already in the bonus with 10 minutes left in the half, Breakdown. they're screwed. Should we do a live breakdown of 60 minutes right now on TBS? <laughs> no. Okay. Kelly's um, still going. You know, Caden Shedger could be an X Factor. So we've got two old presidential candidates. Let's go. It's like, yeah. I don't want to talk about it either. What about Aaron Rodgers? I want to talk about Aaron <laughs> yeah, Rodgers' want to talk about that political either. campaign. Please. Let's talk about sports. Yeah. Uh, um, BK, it, though, is like defensively, like where are you at with them? Well, I think Caden Shedrick could be a huge factor for this team. And his, his injuries, plural, have been something that I think has cost this Texas team all year long. Because I mean, He's one of the better defensive players in the country. And like at Virginia, we saw that under Tony Bennett. I mean, that guy can be a really good rim protector. And that allows defenses to take gambles a little bit, to take more risk on the outside because you know you have that backline defender who's going to adjust shots or block shots at the rim. And because he just hasn't played that much and hasn't been that effective when he has played, that has just been a, a wrinkle in Texas this year. So if he somehow is healthy enough, this extra week has given him some time. It feels like he's played better in the last couple of weeks. If he can be He there, looked a little better even than the did. one game in the Big 12. And maybe yeah, expecting right. something from a guy who might only play 10 to 15 minutes a game is, is ridiculous. But, I, God, I just I want to see that guy be a part, especially if it's against Virginia, right, the team he played against. Mm-hmm. You know, Zay, guys are juiced Did they get up. in, by the way? Yeah, they're in. They're yeah, in? Yeah, that's a Texas my play. They were, like, first four out, yeah. I thought. Yeah, they oh, were right oh, there. Oh, was that Virginia on the 7-10? Yeah, this is yeah. them. They got Colorado okay. State. Got it. Yeah, so, it's you know, sometimes guys are a little extra motivated going up against their former team except for Tyrese Hunter. Uh, sometimes that matters, though. And I, like Caden Shedrick, I think he can open things up for the rest of this Texas defense if he's actually on the floor. Yeah, Rodney Terry, I know we got to wrap this up soon, but Rodney yeah. Terry is no, we very don't. afraid. We're, we actually, uh, <laughs> well, me and Brad here have been rolling for two hours. I know. Guys, I've, been, I've been listening. You've been listening. So, okay, been listening, cool. I appreciate right? that. But um, Rodney Terry is nervous for getting Caden Shedrick and Dylan Basu in the foul trouble. So then you have no five. You're playing with nothing but forwards, and you don't have no true center, even though Dylan Basu is kind of a tweener between forward and center. You won't have one if both of those guys get in the foul trouble, and you might have to play Brock Cunningham and Dylan Mitchell at your four or five spot, and I don't think those guys play together at all. I You either want Dylan Mitchell in or Brock Cunningham in yeah. for you know the horn success. At times, you could put Shedrick and Dylan Basu in, but again, you're risking both of those guys getting in the foul trouble, and that can really muck stuff up for the rest of the game. So I I test it. I test Caden Shedrick and Dylan Basu on the court at times, maybe a four minute stretch, eight minute stretch, depending on the matchup, and see to what you were saying, BK, allow Shedrick to be that defensive stopper, but. Again, that's what makes Texas so scary. They could play different matchups in the tournament. They could go small and have uh, Brock Cunningham playing your four and DeSue playing your five. They could go big and have DeSue playing your four and Shedrick your five and maybe a Dylan Mitchell or Brock Cunningham at your three, and we know those guards there that will round it up. So if Rodney Terry, he has to be terrific with his game plan and the substitution method, all those things have to be really strategic. And if he does that, Horns, they could roll. This is it. I mean, it's time for Rodney Terry. You know, legacies are made in March, not yeah. just for the players, but for coaches too. Like he, made a, he, he made a run last year. He did, man. and that's what you know. got him the job. Like, yeah. he, he's not going to get an extension or anything if Texas makes a deep run this year. But, but he's not going to get fired either way. The, exactly. No. But the whole narrative changes about Rodney Terry if, if Texas makes totally it back agree. to the second weekend. I mean, look, I, I want Texas to be a basketball school. It'll never happen. But it's been a long time. you got to go back, what, 20 years since Texas has made it to the second weekend in back-to-back tournaments a long time since that's happened. So, you know, Rodney Terry, say what you will about him. Say what you will about how he got the job. Say what you will about this season. If he's able to be that coach to do something that hasn't been done here in two decades, you got to give him his flowers. So uh, if they lose, it won't be because of the players. We know how this fan base is. It'll be because yeah. Rodney Terry screwed yeah, something yeah. up. Right. But y'all better go the other way, too. If Texas does, you know, win this first game and then beat Tennessee in round two, you got to give Arte his love. Let me yeah. ask y'all. So outside of matchups, who's on the court? you got two minutes left. You want your best five in rotationally. Who is that? Zay, start with you. Max Acemas, Tyrese Hunter, Kendall Weaver, Brock Cunningham, Dylan Basu. I agree. Yeah. BK, is that it? 
Do you do, do you do you take out Brock and put someone else in there? I know Brock scares me a little bit. No, he scares all of us in a, in a good and bad way. Yeah. <laughs> I guess you have to trust him at his That's age. Really and, and he's the only guy with an AARP card on the team, so like you feel like that that will pay dividends in a close game at the end of March. So yeah, I'll go with the same five there. Okay. Yeah, Dylan Mitchell, maybe he has to be out with a good game, really good, and then that's even. Yeah, but like Dylan's risk. athleticism and and what he can do, you don't maybe put. I mean, Brock can maybe extend if he's hitting threes, but do you not switch that? I, I think you could switch them out depending on offense defense situation. So if All there's right. a dead ball, yeah, put Brock in there for offense. Right, dead ball defense maybe Dylan Mitchell, but sometimes he'll get lost defensively. You yeah. just never know. From Dylan Mitchell, you need that's someone what, shot in the back of the yeah. head, and bring Rock in, and, <laughs> right, yeah. right, and even Kate Shedrick, depending on the matchup. If you're playing against a lot of bigs, like I was just saying, maybe throw him in there too. I don't know, but yeah, Brock Cunningham, I think he would make more sense in winning time. Yeah, yeah. Let's see what happens. Texas, do we have a date? Is it Thursday or Friday? I'm sure that's been announced yet, and I just oh, haven't seen it on on the X.com. I don't know. Texas will play the winner of Virginia and Colorado State on either Thursday or Friday in the first round of the tournament. Texas will be playing in Charlotte, by the way. No idea what a line is going to be for that game. This is riveting. So they're going to be in Charlotte. So if they play Virginia, that'll be ACC territory. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I'll tell you what, though, because Zay and I were talking when we were two regions in, it looked like Texas, if they were an eight or a nine, they were going to play North Carolina. Right. And North Carolina's playing in Charlotte right now. So you know, I, I'd rather take Virginia. You'd rather be yeah. the seventh seed. You'd rather get a team like when Virginia. And also Tony Bennett, you know, I mean, that it's like two 90-year-olds fucking. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Watching them play? Watching Virginia I'd, play. I'd rather so, watch those two um, 90-year-olds. Um, well, there's some good stuff online. Well, our, Can't do porn Our politicians are letting us watch out, that. Guys out, you know? Guys out the there though. are ways to get that done. Because. I have nothing to watch anymore. It is, it is devastating. <laughs> I mean, my, my life has changed for the worse over the last few days, for sure, because of that. But I wouldn't mind with Virginia, you know? Um, I, I wouldn't either. I mean, they're so bad. They're so bad. They are one of the best defensive teams in the country. Zay, what's your take on that? Like, Just the mat- coaching matchup. Bennett's better Bennett's coach. way better yeah. coach. Yeah. Yeah. A national championship, borderline Hall of Fame coach, and a guy who used to sing incredibly well, yeah. too. Yeah. He had a three, speaking of March Madness, he had a three for Wisconsin Green Bay. His dad was Coach Dick Bennett. And it was a great setup, man. It was a, it was a, uh, your dad would have fucking loved this. Like it was a, a, you know, two seconds left, throw it down, Leitner style, but caught it at midcourt, passed it, passed it to yeah. him. And you remember that? Uh-huh. And, and Tony hit that like 35 footer. Yeah. Yeah. On the right side. Is that Valpo? That wasn't the Valpo shot. That was like the Valpo. No, play. you're thinking of, yeah, you're thinking Bryce of Bryce. Bryce, 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 Bryce okay. Yeah. okay. No, but it was very similar. Similar play. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, that was Tony Bennett, Wisconsin Green Bay. And they they won first, second round game. Yeah. And I remember going nuts. I remember James Forrest beating Harold Miner and Baby Jordan. Like oh, Baby Jordan. I will wow. say this college basketball's changed, but they're still when you get to this time, let's go. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. What'd you call his dad? Um Dick Finish. Yikes. Yeah. I think he was that bad of a guy. But he was named Richard. I call him. Dick. Ah, that's awfully kind of you yeah. right there. Some All people right. call them. Well, we'll stop. <laughs> Any other uh, final thoughts, gentlemen? Obviously, on our shows all week long, we'll be breaking down the matchups. We'll be filling out our brackets. We do have a TSU bracket challenge. It's uh, on ESPN. I'll tweet out the link once again. Uh, so everyone can join. It's completely free to enter. We'll be giving away tons of great prizes so everyone can be a part of it. So make sure uh, you enter there and start filling out your brackets before the round of 64 starts on Thursday. But any final thoughts, gentlemen, before we uh, wrap things up on Texas's draw first and then maybe just on the uh, overall bracket? Uh, Texas got a good draw. Yep. They're in the best region possible. And as far as the whole bracket, my upset right now is McNeese over Gonzaga. 12 wow. over the five. Okay. Like That's McNeese. a good call. Bend against Gonzaga in March is not, not a horrible decision no, on your part. But I watched McNeese the other day playing the tournament. They've won over 30 games this year. They got Will Wade as their they coach? They got Will Wade yeah. as their coach. That dude's Will Wade's slimy. Your coach. Yeah, he's slimy, but he knows what he's doing. He's slimy, but that's a coach oh, he's that. Oh, definitely slimy. <laughs> you got to be slimy to be a good coach. Oh, yeah, though. for sure. But 
that that's a dude I could see. Yeah, with that team and those guards, okay. Mark Few, look out. Okay. Um, I, I would just say, looking at the region, that UT is in a spot where they could make the Final Four. As crazy as that is, I don't think they will. Um, but they could go on a run and get to the Sweet 16. So it's what's fun about this time. And certainly now, one thing, one thing I didn't like about the 80s and 90s, it was a good thing, I guess, in some way. But you didn't have um, – there were some teams you knew couldn't get there. And I think with this region – Texas could lose in the first round, and they could they could make a run. Too, yeah, you know, I've got, um, I've got so many tabs pulled up on my computer. Shit together, no, it's like my uh, YouTube with all my music. I can't. Yeah, you do still listen to music on YouTube. Yeah, one video at a time. You watch ads before every no, single song. Big John use. asked me, and we went through it, and I had like thirty-one songs. And Big John's like, "Dude, you, you've got to." Yeah. As uh, upgrade. as Bucky calls me right now. Oh good. yeah, this call from who else? Good to see that the Buck yeah. is locked into this show right appreciate now. You, Buck. Yeah, pre- appreciate you, Buck. Uh, <laughs> what are you guys up to? It's yeah. like yeah, we're actually doing our we're doing our job. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he was so. supposed to come here today, and he's uh, not was here. he really? He, he told me he wasn't gonna make it. So. All right. I'm picking uh, Longwood and Moorhead State. Right. Of course you are. Yeah, course it's course nothing are. to do with the names. I like their matchups. <laughs> All Quality right. teams this year. Don't ask me for any players on either of I'm, those teams. I just I'm feel like vagina and clitoris. I feel like are they in that? I don't. See, what region are they in? I don't, uh, the no. South, of course. That would that would make the most sense. <laughs> well done. I believe. Yeah. Thank you for uh, putting it on a tee for me. All right. I think that's going to do it for us because it's St. Patty's Day. Yeah. We need some we, music in this joint. Too. Please get out to Crown and Acres. So yep. Big John and and Craig, who owns it, um, like. I've been coming here to answer your question for a long time since I was a little kid. And, like, they're legit people, yeah. good people. And it's old Austin, but, you know. There's not a lot of old Austin joints still around. This, no. This is one of them. No, there's not, especially someone who, who's owned it as long as Craig has. Yeah. And Big John's been around forever and is, like, the best bar manager in the fucking world. Um, like, these are people that really care about Austin. So. <laughs> Great people. Yeah, Crown and Anchor. If you've been here, we don't have to tell you about this place. If you haven't been here. They forgot that I cussed like 19 times on in one hour on my show. Oh, no, so. I appreciate it. I need it. It's healthy. You're rounding down. You're rounding way down. My Actually, friend. I am. Oh, man. Big shout to Crown and Anchor. They're going to be open all night long partying for St. Yeah. Patty's Day. So come out and see them. Always love doing shows here. We'll be back at some point. Great hopefully. burger, too. And then I too. Had it last night. Is that right? Yeah. Really good. Okay. Get the bacon cheeseburger. Get man. you a burger. Very kosher. Get good you a fries, good beer. Too. Just some fries and uh, yeah, come see us. We'll be hanging out here for a little bit longer. That's going to do it for our selection Sunday St. Patty's Day special show from Crown and Anchor Pub. Excited, Texas will open up the tournament this week as a seven seed in the Midwest region. They will take on the winner of Colorado State and Virginia. Nothing to lose, right? Oh, well, except you know, the end of the season. And <laughs> like, are you like, no, there's nothing to lose. Like, we haven't been that good this year. We're seven seed. Let's go. Yeah, you know? Play like that. Play yeah. like there's nothing to lose. Be yeah. loose. Don't be tight. That's what Rick Barnes does at this time of the year. He's not buying that at all. No, not at all. <laughs> better, to lose. Over <laughs> better over chief, in my opinion. Come on now. A lot to lose. All right, for Kevin Dunn and Zay Collier and everyone at Texas Sports Unfiltered, that's going to wrap up our show from Crown and Anchor today. Thank you all so much for listening. Happy St. Paddy's Day. And, of course, we'll be live tomorrow from 8 to 5. We'll be live all week long talking March Madness and uh, the biggest stories in the world of sports, including that riveting Texas baseball series at the Dish. Can't wait to talk about that. Uh, I'm glad we're not playing Washington in the tournament. I'll just I'll say that. I'm tired of seeing them in any sport. Man. Sure, KD will have some thoughts on that on Tuesday. All right. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Happy St. Paddy's Day. We'll talk to you all tomorrow. Hook them. Hook them.